Thank you and welcome to the <clears throat> October 15th, 2019 Planning Board meeting for the Town of Scarborough. You can all join me in rising for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Doreen, could you call the roll, please? Okay. Nicholas McGee. Here. Rachel Hendrickson. Roger Bailey. Here. Robin Saunders. Here. Richard Duperry. Here. Jennifer Ladd. Here. Rick Meinke. Here. Right. With uh, Rachel's absence, we have Rick Duperry, our first alternate, will be voting member this evening. The uh, first uh, item of business is the approval of the minutes from September 23rd, 2019. So moved. I have a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Show that as unanimous. Thank you. Next item is a consent item. Central Maine Power Company requests a site plan review for 35 Broad Turn Road, Assessor's Map R47, Lot 8B. Jamal. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, I have to recuse myself. I don't know when to do it. Okay. So in that instance, we're going to have Rick Meinking, our second alternate, become a voting member for this item. Pretty Jamal. firm enough. Yes. All right. Uh, so this is located in the VR2 uh, zoning district along Broad Turn Road. As you may recall, the applicant is proposing a new substation facility um, with associated utilities. Uh, the applicant was asked for the board in August, um, and the board moved this to a consent item uh, for the next agenda. So the one item that staff noted uh, that hasn't been completed um, that was a main issue last time was the status of their DEP permit. Uh, typically, the board um, needs to have those permits in hand uh, before final approval. Uh, the applicant did provide some email correspondence with the DEP um, and staff stating that the project review is mostly completed and they found no uh, major issues during the initial review. So the remainder of staff's comments have been incorporated into a draft motion as the conditions of approval, uh, with conditions of approval for the board's consideration. Turn it over to you. Thank you, Jamal. Uh, so how, did, how does the board feel uh, about granting a conditional approval as a consent item this evening. We do have um, information from um, DEP stating that this is on its way. I'm comfortable with the proposal. Um, uh, anyone else wants to weigh in? Yeah. Okay. Uh, does the applicant have anything they want to add? This is a consent item. Uh, no, nothing to add, Krista. So with that, I will uh, read the motion. I move to approve the site plan project titled Dunstan Substation, proposed by Central Maine Power Company, as depicted on the plan set prepared by Burns and McDonald, dated 9-16-19, with the following findings and conditions. Findings. The applicant is proposing to construct a new substation facility with associated utilities and stormwater management infrastructure. The new facility will be comp uh, comprised of crushed stone yard containing a single-story control house, a transformer, and associated electrical components placed on concrete foundations. The proposal also includes a new driveway to the Scarborough Sanitary District sewer pump house adjacent to the property. The property will utilize existing frontage on Broad Turn Road. The property is located within the Village Residential 2, VR2 zoning district, and is identified on the Town of Scarborough tax maps as Map R47, Lot 8B. Planning Board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the site plan adequately, adequately addresses the site plan review and zoning ordinance requirements for site utilization and layout, access, internal vehicular movement, parking, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, lighting, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. Conditions. One, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall revise the plan set to include A, a plan note on the erosion and control Erosion and sediment control plan indicating that a silt fence will be used as part of the double sediment barrier on the site. B, enhancements to the ground cover plantings between the proposed substation and the 25-foot stream setback to include compost, bioslope, or other alternative treatment measures. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall A, provide a final approval by the main DEP. B, provide the approved mutual access agreement with the Scarborough Sanitary District. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Three, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. That is the motion. Do I have a second? Second. A motion and a second. 
Is there any discussion? All right. Seeing none, all in favor? So that is unanimous. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next item on our agenda this evening is another consent item. It's Crossroads Holdings LLC requests a technical subdivision amendment for the Innovation District subdivision Scarborough Downs Assessor's Map U52 Lot 4. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, as you noted, this is the Innovation District subdivision. Uh, the applicants before the board tonight uh, for a technical amendment uh, to eliminate an existing conditions layer on the final subdivision plans uh, that was inadvertently included on the recorded plans. Uh, staff is comfortable with the plans as submitted and has provided you all with a draft motion. Thank you, Jamel. Uh, again, this is a, another consent item. Uh, are there any questions from the board on this? Seeing none, I have a motion prepared. I move to approve the project titled The Downs Innovation District proposed by Crossroads Holdings LLC as depicted on the plan set prepared by Oral Palmer, dated 9419, with the following findings. The First Amendment plan includes a technical amendment to eliminate an existing conditions layer that was inadvertently included on the recorded plans. The existing conditions from the July 22, 2019 Planning Board subdivision approval will remain in effect. I've, that's the motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Sure, that is unanimous. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is SCORE Builders requests a site plan review for the Downs Innovation District Assessor's Map U53, Lot 4. Jamal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so as you all may recall, the applicant's proposing a 5,057 uh, square foot building that will be used to run and operate their business. Uh, the proposal is located within Lot 32 uh, within the Innovation District on the corner of Innovation Way and Center Street. Uh, so just a few comments. Um, the zoning standards uh, require a 10-foot wide uh, landscape buffer strip along the front property line. Uh, as requested, the applicant did provide some additional low plantings along Center Street. Uh, so the board should be sure to discuss if you're comfortable with uh, the proposal. And staff would also like to point out again the applicants proposing provide 15 parking spaces instead of the required 18. Uh, so there's a designed three future spaces uh, in case they are warranted at a later date. The zoning standards do allow for the board to reduce these requirements, um, so you need to determine if the proposed use can be carried on with the 15 spaces as proposed. And staff has provided the board, again, with a draft motion uh, for your consideration. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jamel. And we'll turn it over to the applicant at this time. Uh, again, we'll just try to stick to the main points, the ones that we really need the board to weigh in on, and, of course, any other um, changes that we should be aware of. Throughout. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Um, would, you, would you like me to go down through the list of comments, each one, and um, reply to them? Yeah, I mean, you only have two major comments here, right? Okay. So the main, the main com elements is really what we need to be discussing as a board to make sure we weigh in on appropriately. Okay. So the rest of it, as long as you're comfortable with what staff is recommending, yep. there's really no need to cover it. If there's a question that the board might have on anything that staff is recommending, we okay. might bring it up during our process. Okay. Okay. Uh, so to summarize, um, some of the changes we made was planting along Center Street. We carried the plantings along the facade of the building. Um, we also looked into the alignment of the uh, entrance in it to the adjacent lot to the west. Um, the alignment made sense in terms of space and dimensions from the southerly property, as well as keeping away from the wetlands to the property to the, to the, to the west. Um, from a planting and buffering, we provided um, plantings, um, deciduous trees 40 feet on center along the southerly property line, and on the easterly property line indicated um, future uh, buffering um, once the adjacent property is developed, so we can know um, more um, specific areas that will be needed for, for buffering. Um, Otherwise, there really hasn't been any other changes. We added two more red maples adjacent the loading dock area for additional screening. Um, that's kind of that Bosca grove of maples that, that aligns with the, with the um, delivery area. Um, 
In terms of the width, I think there was one question in the comments about the width of the driveway. We have a 25 foot road proposed entrance um, where 26 is required. Given that the use and its, its, uh, the deliveries would be just generally a box truck and just um, employees up to four to five, um, we're proposing to keep that at 25 feet. Um, the signage for the building has been adjusted slightly. Uh, we've raised, raised the sign up um, per code, and I believe the ratio of the sign has been addressed. Um, specifically, if there's any other questions um, or concerns. Thank you very much. Uh, we have an opportunity for public comment. Is there anyone here that would like to speak on this topic? Please approach the podium and state your name. Seeing no public comment, I'm going to close public comment. Uh, Roger, do you want to kick this one off? All right, sure. Um, I'm, uh, I'm actually, I have no problem with the um, waiver request for the 25-foot driveway. Um, and I don't really have, I, I assume you're going to take care of the signage situation with the planning department. Okay. Um, I don't have a problem with the buffering, the way it's the way it's uh, depicted on your plans. I, I, I mean, I think that's a corner lot. The view from right here. I think you want to. I mean, I think it's a, a fine line between too much buffering because you have very attractive build. You have a very attractive building, and I think you want to showcase that. Um, so I don't really have a problem with, uh, with the buffering. Thank you, Roger. Jen. Um, <clears throat> I'm generally fine with what's been proposed um, in terms of buffering. In regard to the parking, I, um, I'm fine with the uh, proposed, you know, holding a few spaces for the future. Um, I think that's a good, I think it's a good move. If you don't think that you need them, but you're keeping space for them, then um, that's great. Purely as a matter of um, curiosity, I have a question about why you chose to hold the three spaces that are sort of closer to the building as opposed to like more towards the back of the um, the parking lot. But um, other than that, I, I think it's great that someone would come in and maybe not need um, quite what, you know, the full, full requirement. Yeah, um, just to respond to that question and comment. <clears throat> so the three parking spaces that are proposed um, are closest to the road and from view from the, from, from the center street. Uh, by pushing them to the back, um, they're less visible. So if they don't get developed, it remains open space in meadow. That was my guess, but thank <laughs> you. <laughs> That's all. Thanks, Jen. Rick? Um, no, I agree with everything that has been said already. I'm pleased now that I look at this a little deeper uh, on the photometrics for your lights that are going toward the, the road. Um, they bleed off quite quickly, so it won't bleed into a major road. So that, that was a plus. So thanks. So thanks. Rick Perry? Uh, I'm okay with the 25 foot. Um, instead of 26 and the buffering as well and the rest of it looked fine to me so looks good thank you I like what you've done with the architecture thank you <laughs> Robin um, can you just remind me again why you went from 26 to 25 feet uh, we were trying to limit the amount of impervious surface given the use um, for this particular um, client um, it's mostly just going to be employees up to a, a total of four or five employees and deliveries are minimal with uh, just a box truck So it's not like an 18 wheeler. So okay. we're just trying to be conscientious about how much impervious service we are including I'm all set Thanks Rob uh, So I think that was pretty basic you came in here with a pretty clean set So um, it's a very attractive building and we're all I think very excited to see this uh, part of Scarborough developed uh, first one in so Thank you. Um, that said, you. I do have uh, a draft motion here. Mm -hmm. I move to approve the site plan pro project titled Score Builders as depicted on the plan set prepared by Kevin Brown Architect and St. Clair Associates dated 9-19-19 with the following findings, waivers, and conditions. 
Findings. The applicant has proposed to construct a 5,057 square foot building with associated parking, landscaping, and pedestrian infrastructure. The proposal is located on lot 32 of the approved Innovation District subdivision within phase two of the Scarborough Downs redevelopment project. The property will utilize frontage on the Innovation Way and Center Street. The property is located within the Crossroads Plan Development CPD Zoning District. The Planning Board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses the site plan review and zoning ordinance requirements for site utilization, layout, access, internal vehicular movement, parking, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, lighting, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. Waivers. One, permit the requested driveway width of 25 feet instead of 26 feet. Conditions. One, the Planning Board has determined that the particular building can be occupied or use carried on with fewer parking spaces than required and has reduced the requirements for off-street parking in accordance with Section 11C in the Zoning Ordinance. Two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall revise a plan set to include A, information related to the innovation roadway design to ensure that grading and stormwater connections are appropriately designed for the site. B, a plan note indicating that light fixtures on the property will be dimmed at the close of business on the site plan. C, a plan note referencing the recorded subdivision plan for the Innovation District on the site plan. D, address the civil peer review comments from Woodard and Curran's memo dated 10-8-19. This shall be review reviewed and approved by the Planning Department. Three, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall pay the traffic impact fees. Four, prior to the issuance of a sign permit, the applicant shall provide an updated signage plan that meets the sign regulations set forth in Zoning Ordinance Section 12. This shall be reviewed and approved by the Planning Department. Five, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the Planning Department. That is the motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second. Discussion? All in favor? I'm sure that is unanimous. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you, you all very much. Item 8 on tonight's agenda, Old Port Realty LLC requests a site plan amendment for 91 County Road, Assessor's Map R15, Lot 53. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the applicants here this evening uh, with a proposal to demolish the existing uh, farmhouse on the property and provide additional uh, landscaping and lawn provisions once the structure is removed. So staff is generally comfortable with the proposal. Uh, we have recommended additional planting provisions uh, where the house was located or will be removed, um, including an addition of a re row of street trees uh, along County Road. So the board should discuss these recommendations this evening and staff has provided the board with a draft motion uh, for your consideration. Leave it at that. Thank you, Jamel. Sean? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Sean Frank. I'm a civil engineer with the uh, Sebago Technics. Uh, with me tonight is Danny Buzianis of Old Port Realty. Uh, this is a project that was approved uh, late 03 or early 04. Uh, and if you've been out there, you can see that basically the one pad site's been constructed, which now houses the uh, Dunkin' Donuts and the subway. Uh, originally, it was anticipated that we'd have a, another small uh, uh, food service, retail, something along the second pad site. And the original proposal was actually to uh, convert the, uh, the old farmhouse into uh, office space so that it would all be commercial in accordance with the, uh, the zoning at the time. Uh, unfortunately, again, it's been 15 years now. Uh, the building is obviously uh, 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 getting in worse shape as the years go by. Uh, the second pad site still has not been rented. Uh, we have heard the potential that, you know, if, if they had better visibility from County Road, perhaps, um, that, that may be a, an asset in terms of uh, obtaining a, a person or a tenant for that area. Uh, so as such, Mr. Chairman, uh, you know, we're sorry to be here, to be honest with you, um, but uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, we really can't find a use, so I haven't been able to find a user for that building. Uh, in the shape it is in now, it'd be a very expensive project to, uh, to rehab it, so uh, we are asking to, uh, to tear it down and demolish it. Uh, we have been in contact with the fire department that they would use it for our training exercises. Uh, certainly we'll be happy to work with them. Uh, as Jamel stated, uh, in terms of the additional landscaping uh, along the parking and as well as the street trees, we're more than happy to, uh, to work with staff with that if, if the board's comfortable with that. Uh, and in terms of uh, the engineering peer review, uh, the original 
the septic system for the farm was removed as part of the initial construction. So as we're really talking about is the overhead electrical lines in the well, which will be uh, uh, abandoned as part of this construction. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And again, Mr. Buzianis is with me as well in terms of if there are any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have an opportunity for public comment this evening on this item. If you are here and would like to speak on this, please approach the podium and state your name. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to open this one up in general. Does anyone have any questions or concerns on this item? Seeing none, I do have a motion prepared. I move to approve the site plan amendment titled Amended Site Plan Scarborough Crossing proposed by Old Port Realty LLC as depicted on the plan set prepared by Sebago Technics dated 9 18 19 with the following findings and conditions. Findings The applicant is proposing to demolish the existing farmhouse on the property and provide additional landscaping provisions once the structure is removed. The property is located within the town and center. Town and Village Center's Transition, TVC2 Zoning District, and is identified on the Town of Scarborough's tax maps as Map R15, Lot 53. Planning Board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation, finds that the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses the site plan review and zoning ordinance requirements for site utilization, layout, access, internal vehicular movement, parking, pedestrian waste, landscaping, stormwater management, lighting, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. Conditions 1. Prior to the issuance of a demolition permit, the applicant shall revise the plan set to include a. Additional landscaping and screening provisions within the front portion of the property as discussed with the planning board. b. Additional deciduous street trees along county road frontage as discussed with the planning board. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. 2. Prior to the issuance of a demolition permit, the I'm sorry, prior to the issuance of the demolition, the applicant shall address the civil peer review comments in Woodard and Curran's memo dated 10 8 19. That's the motion. I have a second. Second. I have a second. Any discussion? All in favor? I'm sure, that is unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Next item on our agenda this evening is AV Technic LLC requests a site plan review for the Downs Innovation District Assessor's Map U53 Lot 4. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so if you all recall, uh, this project's actually located on Lot 28 within the Innovation District uh, across the street, across Innovation Way um, from the Score Builders project. The applicant's proposing a 24,420 a uh, square foot warehouse and office building that will be used to run and operate their business. Uh, so the applicant was before the board uh, back in September uh, for a sketch plan review and has provided plan revisions uh, since then. So the applicant continues to propose uh, two full access driveways along the private drive. Uh, given that this parcel is considered a front lot in the development, the private drive will also provide access um, to the back lots within this portion, portion of the project. So the applicant did reduce the width of the northerly driveway uh, to 100 feet, uh, but staff and the town's uh, consultants, both civil and traffic, uh, continue to have concerns about the width of this driveway. So staff has recommended that the applicant provide an auto turn uh, simulation for the types of vehicles that will need to maneuver in and out of the site as it appears a narrow drive, narrow, narrower driveway would still provide enough room to back into the loading dock and parking areas. So the applicant should discuss this with the board tonight. The applicant did provide some landscaping provisions within the required 10-foot buffer strip and also along the, within the southwestern corner of the site. So staff has recommended uh, additional plannings within this corner given its prominent location uh, within the innovation district. The applicant's also proposing a four-foot wide advisory uh, bicycle and pedestrian lanes uh, along both sides of the private drive. Uh, so given the proximity of this project to the extensive pedestrian infrastructure or gathering areas um, and the two driveways, two curb cuts, staff uh, does continue to recommend that the applicant uh, provide a sidewalk along one side of the private drive. So the board should discuss this. And staff was unable to determine if the fenestration requirements uh, set forth in the zoning regulations have been met. So the applicant will need to provide a plan um, depicting so. And then finally, with the parking, uh, the applicant's also proposing uh, much less parking than is required. Uh, looks like they're designing or proposing 18 spaces and have de designated 37 future spaces. So that, again, the board will have to determine uh, if you're comfortable with this approach. 
And given that a significant amount of required parking is not re proposed, uh, staff does recommend that any change in use on the, on the lot require review by either staff or the board uh, to ensure adequate parking in the future. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jamel. The applicant would like to go ahead and proceed. Hey, Dan. Thank you very much. Uh, Dan Bacon here on behalf of Scarborough Downs and also AV Technic. Um, I want to thank the board for reviewing the site plan. Uh, we were last before, uh, I think, many of you on September 3rd for sketch plan, at which time uh, we reviewed and, and presented the, the general site plan um, and got some good feedback from the board on making some improvements in terms of landscaping, um, provided the architectural uh, rendering. And at that meeting, we talked a fair amount about the curb cuts and site access um, off of these private drives. Um, I'm gonna have Nancy St. Clair talk about kind of the details of what we've updated since the, our sketch plan meeting, but I thought it was important for me to first present um, the, the private drive kind of design and intent as it uh, was proposed during subdivision that went before the board some months ago, as well as talk a bit about the, uh, um, the advice excuse me, the advisory bike pedestrian lanes, because those are elements that we're, we're gonna be seeing um, other sites uh, work with the board on, so we think it's important at this early stage. This is the first time you're seeing a lot that's utilizing these private drives for access and also for bike ped use, that we talk about those things specifically now to kind of set the tone moving forward um, beyond just the AV Technic site. So, in that regard, um, when the front and back lots were designed in the Innovation District, it was very intentional that there be kind of clear access management, kind of um, specific locations for driveways at uh, the access points to create access to these private drives. Uh, the private drives, though, were intended to be fairly flexible. Um, the private drives aren't streets, they're not um, reviewed the same way under the site plan ordinance. They're essentially shared driveways that every lot owner owns to the center of the driveway. And that was on purpose. Um, it was on purpose to enable a more compact design, a more um, compact design so those, their buildings and sites can utilize the driveways for circulation, for backing, et cetera, um, that there can be uh, larger openings for those purposes because they're on private property. They're not, uh, they're not public streets where access management is, is critical. Um, and so as part of the planning board process, we actually submitted the, the above plan or the plan on the screen that shows different layouts, different design scenarios with access into sites, uh, some of which have curb cuts to parking lots, some of which have curb cuts um, and wider curb cuts to to loading areas. And that was to really kind of reduce the amount of pavement and circulation and area necessary on each lot. And it was also done so um, with the confidence that these are short, dead-end private drives. These aren't through streets where there's gonna be a lot of traffic. It's gonna be two, four, six lots that are gonna be use, utilizing these <coughs> shared private drives. Um, and we took cues on this from other development in Scarborough and also in, in the Portland area, uh, one of which is off of Pleasant Hill Road in the industrial area of Scarborough. So I think this is a pretty good illustration in terms of a public street and driveway separations and width of curb cut versus um, the shared driveway that, that we're showing um, in the Innovation District. Um, and just to kind of orient you, this is, Pleasant Hill Road is here. So this is the public street. Obviously there's, you know, narrow driveways. They have good separation from each other. And then here is what's called Parkway Drive. Um, it's called Parkway Drive because it needed a street name, but it's not, it's not a street. It's a shared driveway that provides access to all of these other sites. And it's, designed that way um, to gain access to those back lots and also to kind of double as parking in some cases to also provide easy kind of backing and circulation. These are overhead doors here. Um, and so 
two very different kind of settings um, in what we are trying to mimic in the innovation district where we have strict control of access on the public street and then we have more flexibility in the light industrial area where it's, it's really common driveways that are going across each lot owner's site. Um, similarly, um, and this is East Bayside, we've been kind of using East Bayside as a model for the innovation district that that has a lot of kind of shared space where there's, there's loading docks next to parking to really kind of provide flexibility um, and more building versus parking lot and to not spread out buildings as much. Um, and so this has a combination of public and, and private streets that do that. But the same kind of pattern is created where there's, um, it's more compact. It's not an industrial park where it's really spread out. Um, with a lot of separation between uses. So I wanted to kind of provide that context because I think there's a kind of question by the peer reviewers around what's the standard for the shared drives. Um, and we believe that's a public street standard, not a shared driveway standard in terms of the width of curb cuts and the separation between them because they're not really curb cuts. They're shared driveways on to another driveway. Um, and they're not streets that are owned and maintained by the town, nor are they through streets where there's gonna be a lot of traffic congestion or issues created by uh, um, trucks backing from the driveway up to a loading dock. So that's one thing I wanted to kind of touch on because um, we think it's an important design element for this site in particular, but also for all the other sites that will be accessed by these shared driveways. The other is, um, the advisory bicycle and pedestrian lanes. Um, and again, these are proposed on the shared driveways, so they're not proposed on public streets. Um, they're proposed on dead end streets that they're not gonna have a lot of traffic. Um, and it's really intended to kind of create an interesting kind of shared space um, on these, these private drives so that there are delineated bicycle and pedestrian areas on both sides. And, and then a shared 16-foot lane in the middle. Um, that's where vehicles will travel unless there's opposing traffic. And then you, you check to see if there's a bike or a pedestrian in the, in the shoulder. And if not, you can um, pass each other. Um, so this has been done on Eastern Road. It's been done in some other communities. Um, the Bicycle Coalition of Maine has been an advocate for this approach to kind of share space. Um, and we think it, it makes a lot of sense in this context so that we're not building another surface, we're not adding more impervious than necessary. We're really kind of optimizing um, these shared driveways for this, provide the striping. It'll re receive winter maintenance, so snow will be cleared versus on a sidewalk, which probably wouldn't. Um, and we think it fits this context. It's not something we'd propose everywhere else or on Scarborough Downs Road, but we think given the light traffic and really that these dead-end roads are essentially business neighborhoods, like all the business owners are gonna know each other, people are, are gonna use it on a daily basis and, and expect pedestrians or bicyclists um, within the driveway. So we think it fits this setting and, and makes sense um, and, is, and is the right approach given the, the nature of the area. So uh, with those, Two highlights I wanted Nancy to touch on the other elements, and then we'll turn it back to the board. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as Dan mentioned, I'm Nancy St. Clair of St. Clair Associates. And uh, Dan has done a great job of introducing the project and kind of hitting the highlights of some of the items that we wanted to talk to you about uh, tonight. Uh, as Dan had mentioned, we were before you back on September 3rd. We did spend a lot of time during that session, if you recall, talking specifically about the circulation in particular uh, on the site, both with the uh, curb cut that is closest to Innovation Way, which is this one right here, uh, as well as the curb cut in the loading area, which is uh, in this location here. And as we discussed uh, during that session, there are specific needs. Uh, there's a lot sort of going on in that loading area. We talked about the internal uh, loading area within the, the building, which is in this area here. We also have an at-grade door here, and we have fleet parking that is provided uh, in this area here. 
So the applicant does have sizable vehicles that uh, he uses to uh, transport the equipment to the venues uh, for his business. And so uh, we talked a little bit about the circulation. I'll get to the turning movements. I do have them for you tonight. Uh, so we can talk a little bit about that uh, as well. But I think one of the things that's important to see graphically on this plan, uh, and I don't know, Jamel, if you could switch to the rendered site plan. we go. Uh, so if you see on this image the blue line, the blue rectangle is actually the property limit. And so one of the things that uh, Dan had discussed, so that's that blue line if you look here along this edge right here. As Dan mentioned, these are private shared access and utility easements that do cross the properties. So we're uh, as Dan mentioned, we're, we're dealing with sort of a unique situation, if you will. It was part of the, the innovation in the innovation district uh, is to have these shared uh, private points of access, uh, which do overlap the property lines uh, and do provide uh, for a shared means of consolidating the circulation and maneuvering patterns uh, within the overall innovation district. This is the first site that's coming before you tonight that actually deals with these private ways. Uh, so we want to make sure that and we are all clear uh, moving forward uh, with how the approach was in the original uh, approvals as far as the applicant's vision on that, I should say the developer's division on that, and the applicant's needs on this particular site. Uh, so there's been talk in the memoranda uh, regarding sort of the, the curb cut widths, if you will, and if you recall this area here was a bit wider than it is on the proposed plan. We reduced it by about 17 feet uh, and sort of tightened it up basically in this area here uh, in order to uh, address some of the, the board's concerns at the last meeting. The curb cut that is located here, uh, it's shown on the plan at 25 feet. Uh, it was reduced as a result of a prior request. The 25 feet is matching the 25 foot dry aisle in a parking lot. Uh, but we can certainly widen it to 26 feet. Uh, it helps with the circulation pattern uh, on the site and it would then not require a waiver from you folks uh, on that particular item. So um, one of the things that has been discussed a bit is the um, actual turning maneuvers. which are shown on this plan. So uh, there's a few things going on here. Um, obviously not every maneuver will happen at the same time, uh, but it does show sort of the, the reasoning behind sort of how we came to the widths that we have uh, on the plan. So in this location here, we have a couple of things going on. One is the ability to get a fire truck, a ladder truck to the front door of the building. Uh, so that determines, if you will, the the leading edge width in this location here to get that truck around into the front of the building. In addition, if you remember, we talked about this at grade access door, so that's a ramp up into the building. That door is going to be used for a combination of things. One is if uh, AV Technic has a customer that needs to pick up a specific piece of equipment, that's the door that they go to uh, and pick that up. So they want to make sure that that is something that's easily accessible from a customer management standpoint. Uh, in addition, they also would have the need to drive their sizable vehicles up into that location as well. So the maneuver that is shown here is that vehicle coming in, coming out into this area here and then backing to that at grade door. Uh, in addition, there's a vehicle turning maneuver to get out and back on to the private access way to come out to Innovation Drive. So that determines the location of that curb cut uh, and the curbing there. We have two docks in this location here, which you see one maneuver for vehicle here, uh, similar maneuver in this area here. These three spaces are for the applicant's fleet parking 
and in order to be able to get a vehicle into this last space, we do need to have this curb cut opening here. So that, as I mentioned, we, we reduced it by about 17 feet, um, but that is basically going from the points of access on the building, uh, whether it's the overhead door or the last fleet parking space uh, in order to allow maneuvering. So there's that piece of the turning uh, maneuver. The last uh, piece of that is a passenger vehicle uh, in this location here and the ability to back out in that last space and be able to turn around and exit the site. There are, I believe, 12 parking spaces on the front. Um, in the staff memoranda, there was a discussion about more than 10 would need to have a waiver uh, on that particular aspect. So we are formally uh, requesting a waiver. We do have a sufficient location for a turnaround for those two additional vehicles uh, beyond uh, what would be uh, for the um, dead end parking, if you will, for more than 10 spaces. So. Um, the other kind of piece of the parking puzzle is with the amount of parking. We are proposing 18 parking spaces for the site plus three fleet vehicle parking spaces, those larger spaces uh, in this area here. So with that, we have prepared for you <clears throat> a plan that showed 55 parking spaces, that's the calculated number of spaces uh, that would be required based on the building size and use uh, per the ordinance. And that additional parking uh, was shown in this location here. Uh, this was filled in, that was filled in, et cetera. That's an exhibit that's in your application materials, but we were able to demonstrate that um, should there ever become a need for that full uh, parking complement that it can be uh, constructed on the site. So. With that, we are also asking you folks to uh, authorize a reduction in parking, provided obviously that we've shown you that exhibit that demonstrates we can meet uh, those standards. So as we mentioned before, there are a few other uh, aspects of the site. You all know that from the uh, original approval of the Innovation District, stormwater is handled uh, overall in a master plan uh, for the Innovation District. The uh, site, this site has a provision for an access to the pipe drainage system, which is about in this area here along the frontage on Innovation Way. We do show in our grading and drainage plan uh, the physical connection and all the piping associated with the site uh, that ties into that. There was a comment, um, one of the staff comments, about um, tying into the grading that is shown on Innovation Way. The spot grades that we have specifically shown on our plan, the grading that we have shown on our plans in that area is the design grade for Innovation Way. So that is all tied in uh, to that. The, the invert elevation that was shown uh, for our connection point is the invert elevation that was provided on the design plans for Innovation Way. So those are all tied together uh, and provided for that. Utilities, uh, as we had mentioned in our application materials, we have um, the, the Innovation District itself uh, has a capacity letter and an ability to serve that was provided for the overall subdivision. Obviously, we're part of that. Um, the pump station was recently approved uh, by the Sanitary District, so that um, comment, I believe, in one of the, the memoranda is no longer applicable uh, on that. We have actually filed our plans with the sanitary district specifically to look at the piping for the sewer connection that comes into the site, and that's on the agenda for the 24th. And as far as capacity, ability to serve, that's all taken care of. It's just the specifics uh, of the piping is what we were asking for the trustees to review, as well as the uh, identification of the capacity reserve fee amount uh, for that. And with fee amounts, uh, we we're going to skip to traffic. <laughs> um, there was an application in your application package. There was an identification of the traffic impact fee that was associated with the project uh, that's been identified. There were a couple of comments um, from the peer reviewer on traffic. 
one of which was a question on the distribution uh, and a trip assignment uh, that was made for this site and how that was uh, accommodated. Uh, Goral Palmer is the traffic engineer that provided that information for us and uh, in contact with Goral Palmer on that. That was based on the modeling and the distribution uh, that was done by PAX. Um, Hooper, I believe is the, the gentleman's name. That was reviewed and approved as part of the innovation district. So the uh, trip assignment is based on what was approved uh, for the overall subdivision uh, for that. And so the other comment was with regard to sight distance. And if any of you folks have been out there, it's pretty flat and pretty open. Uh, and even with the uh, uh, development of the individual lots, given the terrain out there, we don't expect that sight distance is going to be uh, an issue for that. So the last piece of it uh, is with regard to <coughs> The building design and the landscaping. Uh, you folks have seen the landscaping plans and the, this is an elevation view uh, of the building that integrates the architecture that was provided uh, by Ryan Senator Architects and uh, also the landscaping and uh, planting plans that are, were provide, provided by Aceto Landscape Architects. So in the plan, if you look closely, you'll see that there is that 10-foot buffer uh, that's along the, the site frontage in addition to the uh, landscaped area that's between the uh, edge of Innovation Way and the site, so we actually have more uh, than the 10, the 10 feet. Along Innovation Way, the street plantings include the street trees, and then in that other 10-foot um, uh, space on the lot itself, um, it is uh, providing for shrubbery, uh, red twig, dot dogwoods, I think, is the, is the uh, shrubbery that's in there. And you can see that uh, in that image as well. The corner landscaping design um, has a couple pieces going with it as well. Uh, one is the uh, plaza area that's part of the Innovation District plan uh, for the corner location that's shown on the plan. That's actually uh, part of the whole uh, innovation district design, the master plan for landscaping there. And then in the area uh, behind it is a proposed plantings uh, specific to the AV Technic lot. There's a combination of the uh, trees that you'll see in this rendering here, uh, as well as ornamental grasses. And uh, one of the comments that was uh, from the, the uh, peer review on that was a request to provide additional landscaping. And I'm not quite sure whether that review was based on sort of not um, being able to see that the ornamental grasses are something that will actually reach a four foot height uh, and they'll be able to nicely uh, supplement and buffer uh, the views of a vehicle in the driveway, uh, in the parking area there. The applicant did not want to add trees because he has a nice looking building and he wanted to be able to have the opportunity to have that building be seen from that corner. Uh, so the trees that are shown on the plan are based on um, what is a uh, reasonable approach to that, uh, coupled with the ornamental grasses to supplement that. Uh, the signage ties in with the uh, planting plan and the building uh, design itself, and uh, we can talk a little bit more about that. Uh, if folks want to know some specifics on the numbers themselves, I do have them. Uh, the last piece on the landscaping is on the easterly side of the building. So <clears throat> that's along this edge here. Uh, we sit um, pretty close to the setback uh, in that location. Uh, it's an area where the, the roof from the warehouse area actually sheets that way. Uh, Proposed along that edge is a pollinator meadow. Uh, so they are perennial grasses that will grow of varying heights, varying color, seasonal variation, that type of thing uh, in that area. But they're hardy. And uh, to um, add additional landscaping, particularly when we don't know what these other two lots may hold in store for placement of buildings, um, is not something that we'd like to pursue at this point for concern of basically investing in uh, improvements in that area only to be shielded by another building that's, that's situated there. 
Uh, there are two lots that abut this because that line right there is the dividing line between that first building lot and the second building lot. So um, there's a good chance that one of the two, if not both, uh, could choose to put their building uh, right up against the setback and um, that would end up uh, not being something that would be amenable to investing a significant amount beyond what is already proposed there, which are the, the uh, perennial grasses, the pollinator meadow in that area. We do have plantings along the backside of the building in this area here. And as we mentioned, we obviously have the landscape plan really focused on the, the front and the more visible uh, view of the lot. So um, sort of circling back to the, the primary discussion uh, that we had um, last time, and I think something that's still uh, on the table is the uh, curb cuts, the access points, that type of thing, um, and sort of the approach to the design in the innovation district uh, versus the site plan standards if they were applied similar to access to a public street. Uh, so we'd like to talk uh, with you folks about that. If indeed there is a need for us to actually seek those waivers, uh, then certainly we would respectfully request those waivers given the description and the information that we've provided to you tonight on our circulation needs uh, for the site. So uh, with that, I'll turn it to you folks for questions. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, we have an opportunity for public comment on this item. If there's anyone here that would like to speak, please approach the podium, state your name. All right. Seeing that, I'm going to close public comment. Uh, Jamel. Yeah, I'd just uh, I'd like to just chat about the access. It is a unique project. Um, and I would like to just point the board to the regulating plan, which is the zoning standards that were approved for this project as part of the master plan. And I think where staff was coming from is if you look at the front lot renderings, um, it shows um, the secondary frontage, the private drive, having um, pretty traditional curb cuts um, on the site. And, uh, and then the back lots do show the type of development that the the, product, the applicant is proposing off the secondary frontage on a back site with, you know, really no regulations to curb cuts and understanding that the, the, the secondary frontage on a back lot would be, you know, be more exempt from the site plan standards. And I would, you know, we'd also just like to point out that the board is allowed to review and look at driveways on private sites. Um, you've been looking at driveways on Main Med um, and other projects. so. I know that this is a unique project, but don't feel like that you can't, you know, review the curb cuts along a private drive because it is unique and private. You do. You can. The standards allow you to do that. So I guess I just don't feel like you can't. I'll stop it there. Thank you. Uh, Robin, do you want to start this? I think would it help to focus this? I mean, it might help as a board if we just kind of tackle, you know, one big item at a time, at least for the sake of clarity, we don't get sidetracked too much. Uh, we can end up all over the place on this if we let ourselves. So um, why don't we focus comments as a board, uh, at least to try to get some sort of clarity along these curb cuts. Um, the, the two, I think the two driveways um, <coughs> I think would be helpful as we look at the rest of the items. In general, if, if you want to start with me, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm concerned why there's question of staff and peer reviewers, period, on a lot of these things. I don't know if it applies to curb cuts, but, but also um, some question as to, you know, what standards do apply. The staff that we have and the peer reviewers that we have have been doing this for a long time. And... Uh, I guess I'm, I'm sort of moving into site access, so I'll stop there. But, but I, I generally completely support what Jamel is saying as far as these may be private drives. There may be some nuances involved with how we can be creative with this. But we've had a long time, you know, again, there's been a lot of time and effort that's been put into um, understanding what the, the downs regulations are, and so let's work within them. All right, thank you. Uh, Rick. Uh, 
I agree with Robin in that we should try to work within the standards that we have. Um, at the same time, if it is a private drive, then I would tend to uh, understand that it is a driveway and not necessarily a public road, as the applicant has pointed out. So um, I'd again lean towards staff and, and get a feeling for their recommendations when it comes to curb cuts and whether or not they feel strongly about it. Thanks, Rick. I'm going to take a turn. You guys are staying down there for a minute. I have a couple questions. Uh, Nancy, if you could help me real quick. Um, did you, the three parking spaces that are located for the um, company vehicles? The, yes. Uh, is, do they need to be backed in? I mean, I'm sure that's probably ideal, but is it required? Like, are there doors, roll up doors or something there that back into those, or is that just a, their parking spot next to the building? It's their spot next to the building. There's no uh, door access uh, at that location. But if you drive into a space, you've got to be able to back out too. So um, the sure. preference is to keep them backed in. Um, but even if they were to drive in, they still have to make a maneuver to get back out. Right, and I and I don't know if um, you had maybe checked at uh, maybe more of an angled parking rather than a straight on. And the only reason I bring it up, and it has it does relate to the curb cuts I'm getting there in a roundabout way, is there might be an opportunity for you know uh, both parties to walk away with some sort of sense of satisfaction here by reducing the the um, the hundred feet down to eighty or whatever. If that maneuver isn't so much of a head-on as it is, a, you could pull it in and then back it out, knowing full well that one way or the other, if you were at an angle, you might be able to save some of that maneuver. But I don't know if you guys investigated it or looked at it. Do you have any? We had given some thought to that to try to do some sort of angle. The, the issues that we also have are that area has two retaining walls that project out to allow you to drive down into the dock that's within the building. So you're, you're a bit constrained on that whole maneuvering area to be able to, if you've got a truck that comes in at an angle, to be able to spin it around and get it back out uh, in that area. So that was one of the reasons why it, it seemed that it would be better just to have it at a 90 degree. Okay. And then as far as, um, Yeah, it's. I think we're working with a you know an, an interesting situation here because you definitely have some specific needs that the client needs correct. to make this work, and That's and I definitely want to be sensitive to that as well, and That's completely correct. also understand staff's point of view on this, which is, yep. here's what was kind of pitched at the beginning, yep. and this is the first one in, and you're about to set the tone, mm -hmm. so I, I, that puts us in a, a tight spot, which is why we get paid the big bucks, right, guys? Um, <laughs> so, and it, I, I mean. <laughs> Believe me, we've we've been sensitive to the width as well, and we've looked at you know a number of different alternatives, trying to make sure that we're as effective as possible in reducing that width, but still being able to accommodate a variety of needs that have to happen uh, in that loading area, simply because of the design and the function uh, of the applicant's building itself. Mr. Chair. Yes. So not being a trucker myself. Um, <laughs> but knowing a few. Um, it, there are things called donkeys and other sort of maneuvering equipment that can be an investment here to meet the, the current standard. So I don't necessarily want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I think that there can be some options that um, there must be a reason that this is mo Well, I guess I'm wondering, is the applicant here? <coughs> Yes. Okay. I'm wondering why we're leaving Darling Avenue in South Portland to come here. Daniel Willis, save you technic. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, we're leaving Dar Darling Avenue. Um, I bought Darling Avenue in 2012. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we had moved there from a 5,000 square foot space, which was part of the, uh, the Welch signage building, actually, here mm -hmm. in, uh, in the Industrial Park in Scarborough. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, so we bought that building in 2012. It's uh, about 10,500 square feet. At that time, there were uh, five of us, and, um, and most of it is to store our, our 
audiovisual or production equipment for events. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a year, uh, it's actually just a little over a year ago, um, I had acquired one of my competitors or one of, one of the other folks in town that do a similar uh, business. Um, it was owned by two gentlemen and one of them was retiring mm -hmm. and the other one was not, it's not a lot younger than he is and so they were looking for someone maybe a little bit younger and uh, mm -hmm. that might want to carry their legacy along and sort of continue to build their business. So. As part of that, um, the agreement was very happily, uh, it was to sort of take their business and bring it into ours, along with their employees, their staff, their gear, and all of that kind of stuff, their trucks. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, very quickly, we got um, a bit bigger. Uh, and so um, uh, over the last year, we've been working very, very hard to try to uh, be efficient in a space. Uh, they, their, their space was uh, about 5,000 square feet. Um, but um, uh, since then, we've we've continued to grow more, mm -hmm. and we just um, we have uh, we have three foot aisles, three and a half foot aisles, <laughs> you know, of racks, mm -hmm. and and there's just no room to do anything. Um, trying to pull uh, shows. I mean, sometimes we might, for example, when we did the uh, when we did the governor's inauguration, we did all the sound and the lights and the video and the drapery and the streaming and the whole thing. Um, we had uh, uh, six trucks, four 24 foot trucks, and two 16 foot trucks as part of that. Uh, that flow that had to go mm -hmm. up to the Augusta Civic Center to produce this. And we basically have uh, less than a 26 foot, uh, but when I say 26 foot truck, the, that's the box itself of prep space in our warehouse. So do you own only your fleet vehicles? Most of you, them. Okay, we, so we, do also, we do also have to contract, uh, you know, a Penske or a Ryder, Ryder or something or exactly okay. uh, to support, support okay. certain shows. And so it seems like Penske and Ryder may also... Um, First of all, welcome to Scarborough. We were really welcome excited back. about yes, this. Thank welcome you. Back. Welcome back. <laughs> and these are good problems to have that yeah. you're growing and acquiring. Yeah. And thank you for letting us know that we have um, a business like you in our midst. And we're very proud and keep doing what you're doing thank kind you. of a thing. And um, the Innovation District is a fabulous place for you. We just have, we have some things that we need to work around because it is a precedent setting type of situation yeah. so thank you as and just please understand as we move through this there's nothing to do with you don't hate me yeah <laughs> love you we love you no worries i guess I, 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 we we knew as as sort of a little bit of a pioneer in some of yes. this that um there was going to be some standards yeah. that were going to have to be defined yeah. and yeah there's some pros to that and our yeah. position and then there's yeah. some challenges to that and so, so thank you for just Waiting, you know, so being being patient and choosing I'm super Scarborough. excited about this. Okay, so good. yeah, absolutely. Us too. So either way, the the big picture is we we need some breathing room. Good. We need we need a yeah. lot more breathing room yeah. because my guys are are you know work so hard. Yep. Um, and uh, I don't feel like I'm giving them the ability to do their job well yeah. in this space. And so, yeah. with this new building that yeah. we're going to build from the ground up, it's an opportunity yeah. to really make it. And not to put you too much on the spot here, but I'm a little bit I'm a little bit. Um, uneasy too with the decision not to have too many trees you want us to sort of not have trees masking your building mm. kind of thing yeah so so i mean you know i can talk about it from a from a heart standpoint more so than a technical standpoint but yeah. you know I, I know as a front lot um um that sort of the concept um was to sort of have the building you know what i mean in the parking around the back and and mm -hmm. um um so I think a couple things. One is is that because of you know the amount of of sort of maneuverability and trucks and stuff, that the lot uh, to to do that was going to make it a bit tight for for the right. trucks to try to get around the yep. back and through the side between the. Um, but um, the other thing is is that we're trying as as really a warehousing space. So that we'll we'll have about five thousand fifty five hundred square feet of really beautiful uh, uh, front office space. Um, is is that um, having the front of the building towards innovation mm -hmm. uh, way and sort of that center front lot, it's the more attractive part of the building versus sort of spinning mm -hmm. it and putting the mm -hmm. attractive part towards the back of mm -hmm. the lot. So instead mm -hmm. of just seeing sort of a flat mm -hmm. steel, you mm -hmm. know, uh, the really pretty part, if you will, of our building is I think is in the front. And, I, and, I, and it's sort of to try to go through the efforts of making it attractive with, with a neat architecture, reverse slopes, um, an interesting uh, canopy area, nice glass. Mm -hmm. uh, we're having nice composite panels, mm -hmm. uh, overlay panels mm -hmm. to try to make it uh, feel modern and welcoming. And um, 
I, I understand trying to make sure there's good buffer, but I also feel like with all the energy and the excitement that I just don't want my building just buried mm -hmm. behind a bunch of trees Absolutely. and not being able to be seen as people approach. I'm proud of the building, yeah. you know, and I want my employees to be proud of the building, and I want, I want, to, yep. I want to showcase that. And landscaping is something to be proud of too, Mr. Willis. So, um, yeah. but and you have the right landscape park. You know, you have a, a fabulous team, I'm and so I pumped. know yeah, that absolutely. you'll come up with some really creative solutions. And I apologize for sort of hijacking the, the conversation, but it's really meaningful to me to hear from you yeah. as the applicant. I'm happy to and yeah. understand where you're coming from. Right. So, Thanks a lot. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So, so do you want to? Could I just add something to sure. that? Um, if, I know, Robin, unfortunately, you weren't here at the last meeting, um, but one of the things that we did discuss at the last meeting was uh, Daniel's need for his internal loading area configuration. Um, with the electronics and the sensitive equipment, um, basically these trucks are loaded from within the building, so that uh, area that you see is actually an, a drive-in dock <laughs> area, uh, so that the, the trucks are protected from the elements when they are being loaded and unloaded. And as Daniel mentioned, all of the many things, I've been to his warehouse, there's a ton of variety uh, in that warehouse of all the different things that need to be uh, on that truck uh, to plan that venue appropriately. So the effective use of their warehousing <coughs> space is also key to their operation. So the U-shaped warehouse uh, that centers around that dock area really dictates the placement of that dock on the building so that they can have that U-shaped circulation and can do effective planning uh, as far as all the many pieces that have to go into it, whether it's the right height uh, step ladder and the proper extension cords or the high-tech piece of equipment that's going to create uh, a, a screen wall uh, for, the, for the venue. So all of those pieces go into that planning and effort, and it is a function of how the building needs to be designed. So those dock doors end up being situated uh, where they are on the building, and they do have to be recessed. So in order to accommodate that coupled with an at-grade door, that's where we end up with the retaining walls uh, on the site as well. So I just wanted to kind of sort of touch base with that as well. Thank you. So I do need to circle us back to these curb cuts. Roger. Um, I um, I tend to agree with uh, what Dan the way Dan was describing these <laughs> private ways, and um, I think this would be a totally different discussion if we were talking about down behind you know uh, behind school builders, uh, you know on, on Center Street where we'd have these, these uh, curb cups coming right off of the main road, but here we we have these on the on the um, those private ways. And, I, and I, I appreciate that you've tried to reduce the curb cuts, but <clears throat> I tend to um, want to give some leeway to the, um, the property owner, the, the business owner, because they, they know what they have to do, what they're trying to do, and I want to try and um, accommodate their particular needs and not, you know, I'm, I don't want to be fighting over a few feet here and there. It, it makes it more difficult for them to be able to perform what they have to do, their operation. Um, and I think being on this, on this private way, um, I think that this is an, a, a great example of how this is probably gonna work its way out throughout the whole, the, whole, um, the remainder of the innovation way, the, the whole uh, development. Um, I think it's, um, I think we're, we're fortunate that there, this property owner, business owner is selected, you know, he's one of the first ones to come in here because he's setting an example, and I think he's setting a good, a good example because um, he could probably very easily have picked one. I don't know how the lots are being selected, whether you were forced to take this lot or not, but, uh, or whether you said, I want a back lot somewhere where I don't have to deal with all this stuff, you know? Um, I'm far off from saying that at one point. <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, I, I, I really want to give the, uh, the business owner the benefit of the doubt that he knows what he needs to make this work. And, um, and as far as the, the buffering, 
I mean, I, I have no, I, I mean, I'm not against trees and everything, but I, I, I mean, this is a very attractive looking building. In fact, when you're talking about the ornamental grasses, if it's going to grow four feet tall, you might block out your sign. So, <laughs> um, but I mean, I think we've got to be sensitive to the buffering. We want buffering. We want good landscaping. But if we're going to have attractive buildings, uh, I want to showcase the buildings mm -hmm. as well because we want to set examples for what the other buildings in the future are going to be like as well. So um, that's my two cents. Jen? Do you still only want comments on the curb cuts? OK. Um, so a couple questions to start. Um, the, what are the largest vehicles that you own? The, lar the longest, I guess. So we, we are commonly um, uh, utilizing what, what you'd call a 26-foot box truck, and those are, you know, with the, with the cab and everything, they're, you know, in the 35-foot range. Um, we do not have any semi uh, semi uh, trailers, uh, tractor trailers in our um, in our fleet. Nor do I see that ever being a reality. That being said, that uh, we could go a month or two with no semis coming to our property, and then we might have two or three within a month. Most most often, there it's a delivery. Uh, we might purchase a, a large piece of equipment, or uh, we might need to ship something. Uh, across country where we would sub hire a, 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 a fleet service, if you will. So, so we do have semis that do need to be able to maneuver and access our facility. It, it is a requirement. We do not own any in our fleet. And so expanding on that, how do you, because your site, the parking field, I'm guessing, th there's not dimensions and I'm not, I don't have it scaled off on my screen, but I'm guessing you don't have maneuverability here to, ba to fully back a semi in off the road. So we, how, how do you envision that type of delivery occurring? With yeah, for sure, for sure. We do. We've designed, so um, uh, again, as Nancy uh, said, um, you know, we've got three dock doors. Uh, one is at grade, and that's the one to the s south side of the, uh, the property. That's right. And then we have two um, uh, loading dock height uh, doors that... Uh, that would allow me to bring a full 26 foot truck into Partially. the building, right? Okay. And, and as Nancy had said, it's, it's, it is for the security and the well being of the equipment, but it's more importantly from the security and well being of, of my staff who need to load and unload in the middle of a snowstorm in February, and now they can do it safely and in, in warmth. So a semi cannot back fully into the building and have that outer door closed. That being said, uh, the majority of the the, of the truck, that that interior bay, I think, is roughly was it 40 or 50 feet? The sort of the inside portion, it's 40, it's 40 feet. So, um, so the, the 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 way we've designed the grade and the dock doors, a semi can come into the building to do an offload or an onload. Typically, a semi is only at our facility for. 15, 20 minutes, right, for an on and off. But there will never be a, 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 a scenario when a truck is backed in with a loading unload where it would be in the private road. It would be completely contained within our property. Okay. Uh, I think that's what you're asking. Yeah, that's good um, design. But certainly being able to get them to, to maneuver, they will need that private, <laughs> private drive Some to be able to get into, into the space, exactly. Sure. Um, so. Great. Okay. Um, for the, okay, so that's, so you've covered your own vehicles. Um, so, so a box truck, a standard box truck, those would be the type of vehicles that you're envisioning parking in the three spaces to the north, is that right? Yeah, we have a variety of sizes all the way down to, to, to little the smaller van. vans, sure. right? So, um, and that parking would, will accommodate our fleet. Sometimes our fleet will be inside the building, you know, if there's a, Big Nor'easter coming. I'm going to pull all those as many as I can into the building to save the guys from having to clean them off. Um, if we have to rent additional vehicles, uh, some that'll provide some overflow. Again, the internal parking will will also uh, satisfy uh, some of those trucks. So it's a combination of of both. Okay, great. 
your um, feedback is, is helpful and um, provides good context, I think, for how um, this site is unique, not just in its location within the innovation district, but how you've worked together um, to have it really fit you. So partial internal loading bay is maybe not standard for your average no. um, yeah. warehouse building, but um, a good idea. So good job to your whole yeah, team. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. And also just one, one added point, and, I, and, and um, again, just based on sort of the curb cut and the parking, um, and potentially pulling in or at angles or this or that. Again, the the opportunity here is to to ensure that that all the comings and goings, especially of the guys that my staff. I mean, a, a normal show day could be 18, 19 hours long, and so the idea is is that if they're coming back at um, later on in the evening or after a very long day or in a snowstorm, the the idea is is that they really can maneuver in without having to fight with other trucks or with curbs and mm -hmm. things like that. So again, it's all part of this this sure. trying to make sure that that the staff and the company, we can work safely and efficiently, so. Um, great, so I can, I appreciate all of that. Um, and um, just one other question about the expanded, where you've shown the expanded parking option, which I noticed also had a couple of the curb lines adjusted, I'm assuming that the the exercise there was to exhibit the required parking based on sort of a more generic use of this building because it very much looks like that parking option would not fit for this usage. that is correct right? the applicant's building is predominantly warehouse driven with a small office space the uh, parking provisions that are shown at 55 spaces would not be something that the applicant would be the occupant of that building. Uh, so with that, there's a transition that, you know, if you need all these parking spaces, then presumably you have more people on the site as opposed to items. And so you, you're not necessarily holding any space here for future parking if you deem that your usage needs it. And I'm asking because the expanded parking option did show like one of the driveway entrances closed and replaced with um, parking. That's correct. Right. Um, there is provision uh, on the, um, if you will, the, the westerly face of the building where there's a green area uh, that there could be, if the applicant needed to have additional parking, that could be put in and still have the circulation pattern be just the same uh, as it is on the site. Okay. Um, and my last comment, which is loosely curb cut related, has to do with the proposed uh, bike pet advisory lanes and the connections drawn between this facility and um, similar situations elsewhere, um, which is just that any time that you have a wide open curb cut like this, 100 feet, even 80 feet, versus something that's like 30 feet or 40 feet, which is still wide by by driveway standards, um, you're just putting any other vulnerable users of that advisory lane at a greater risk. And I say that understanding that this use and potentially others um, at the end of this private way are probably not going to be high generators of that type of traffic, but none of us really know that right now. Um, and so, you know, the I come from a transportation background, and so the idea that a semi-truck would have to make a multi-point turn backing into this facility over the same space that we've indicated is a safe space for someone to be biking or walking um, does give me a little bit of a hang-up, but I know that, the, the, that what you're designing and the intent of this area in general, the risk for that is probably low. Um, so I would just urge you to go back and continue to look for any additional ways that you might be able to shrink that up. And I know that you've done that to a certain extent already, um, but you know, if it's something like, oh, the other comment I wanted to make was that if the majority of the vehicles pulling in and out of the site are yours, owned by your company, or driven by employees of yours, 
you're sort of in an, at an advantage because you could have, there's a training opportunity there to say, look, it's back in parking only. And, you know, end of story. Maybe you do that already, maybe you don't. Um, that's a proven uh, safety measure for, you know, just making vehicle movements more safe versus something that's a much more public, uh, a facility where a variety of drivers and a variety of companies would be coming to, um, to make deliveries, so. Do you want to say something? Uh, just, yeah. I was just gonna say, yeah, I would say probably uh, 80 to 85% of the traffic is, is, is us, it's yeah. our staff, so yeah. yeah. It's so that's accurate. great, they'll, they'll learn their own, you know. Yeah, we uh, back everything in uh, currently. So um, it's, it's, yes, agreed, thanks. Okay. So one comment on that and, and perhaps a suggestion that, that might be a, a condition of the approval is that where we do show that uh, striped pattern uh, across the, the lane is to actually offset that uh, so that there's another one at the extent of that 24 foot width. So it almost creates like a, a corridor uh, across the, the curb cut openings. Uh, actually, on both of them, we could do that, um, which would be sort of an additional uh, notification, if you will, that something's going on there that you, you, know, you have a shared use. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Rick? Yes. Thank you for all the clarifications, and this is exciting. I will make a note that you might have been pigeonholed into this lot because it is one of the bigger ones on this private road. And given that fact, I think there's a little bit more of a soft spot, if you will, or a, a way to soften the, the curb cut width, uh, given the way you've explained the traffic flow and um, that it is one of the larger lots there. Um, so I think that's, a, you heard a lot from these fine people. Uh, I don't need to keep hashing over the same thing, but uh, um, I think you're winning some, some soft spots. That's all. Thanks, Rick. All right, I have a couple thoughts, just a couple. Um, your, your building isn't exactly on the setback line to the rear, is it, uh, to the north side? Uh, not to the north side, no. There's probably on the order of about eight feet. Well, that's possibly eight feet of savings. Um, <laughs> if it's shifted and then the center curb, curbing area, parking area, that little C, that grew by eight feet. Anyways, I'm not gonna engineer this thing for you. Um, but. I feel like there's probably some wiggle room here to make this, just to tighten it up a bit. Um, and, it, and I see the real challenge is, you know, we're looking at a, a front lot that has back lot characteristics. Um, it, you know, according to the, you know, the zoning that was kind of approved by this board on the master level. Um, as far as the roadway and, you know, or the driveway, I'm not a huge fan of the bicycle lanes, and I'll tell you why. I don't think it's gonna be used as a bicycle lane by very many people at all. And the current traffic patterns utilized when you have a bicycle, one-way bicycle lanes on both sides type of design is that the person coming out, heading towards the main roads is gonna be driving down the center of the road. And then if I have somebody trying to take a left turn or a right turn into that property, I may have the off pedestrian standing in their foot foot wide aisle and I have a, some sort of truck in the center and then somebody trying to make a maneuver around a corner. What I would prefer to see in a situation like this would actually be the sidewalk from the center, from the main way, actually wrap around all the way to the point of the first buffering where the sign, the sign is, that little first buffer area. If that sidewalk at least wrapped around that far I would say that a pedestrian, instead of jumping into a bunch of grass, would be standing on a sidewalk versus, you know, if somebody did come around that corner. I mean, I'm thinking safety at this point. Does it make sense to you? So t to clarify, um, I'm not asking for sidewalks all the way down. What I'm saying is that front corner. If I understand what you're proposing, is to basically do a connector up to here? 
Just yeah, the, like right right here. So if it, the sidewalk went just around, I think you create a, a potential, you prevent a possible safety issue with any pedestrian, mm -hmm. whether it's a, somebody on foot or by bike coming down, you know, a four, a four foot wide with two vehicles trying to move at the same time. And that would be just to get them in and understanding there's probably very little pedestrian activity that's probably gonna happen on this private driveway. Um, so I, I'd like you to kind of think that over. I mean, that's, I'm not saying that's the solution to this. I'm just saying chew on it <laughs> and maybe it, maybe it does something. Um, you know. So are you, are you suggesting that we look all the way up to here or just something more just to get them around the corner itself? I would think if you got them, got them past the, you know, if they're coming down on either side or down the center of that road, but they have an opportunity right here, to jump into a sidewalk. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's probably, I think most people would take that opportunity, yeah. I would think. Mr. Chair, aren't, yes. is, isn't there, um, you know, because we're sort of, crossing over into the, <laughs> no pun intended, mm -hmm. into the sidewalk conversation. And um, I, I um, could maybe we go there next. It seems like a yeah, good segue. Yeah, they're kind of related. Yeah, because <laughs> I, I, I am, uh, like some others have said here, not necessarily in favor of the advisory bike and, bike and pedestrian lane instead of sidewalks. Um, because we're we're like right dead in the center of this area here. We're at you know the sort of a, a crossroads in this at this prime location, and to to throw sidewalks out at this point, I think is would be uh, a mistake. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I think it's they are related to some extent. Um, how that dri shared driveway is going to be used versus um, where your curb cuts are. Not sure a sidewalk going any further in the personal opinion uh, going a whole lot further in is going to help you, especially with curb cuts of that size. Um, you're still going to be you're going to have to, you know, we're going to hope that people use their heads when they cross streets and drivers are actually looking to not hit things. So um, I think, yes. Uh, just a question pertaining to that. Uh, when I'm looking at this rendering here. Yes. Okay. Um, it's, if I understand your concern is you. The, the sidewalk on the private road was going to go down to Innovation Way without a connection to the sidewalk? Is that what you were saying? When I, no. Because there is a connection. See, this, this is the sidewalk right here. What I'm saying is to get, it, to get it to go down the private drive. Right. Just a little ways to get people out of that car. I'd, I'd caution that we not re-engineer this for them, but really talk about the issues more generally. And yeah, and, and as yeah. I said, you know, I, I hope you give it some thought about how this could maybe be constructed a little differently, knowing full well that we're going to ask probably others to replicate this pattern throughout the entire development. Um, I, certainly, I certainly do understand your mm -hmm. comment with regard to uh, the intersection itself. There are, uh, as part of the Innovation District plans, there are, as you can see on this plan, uh, very, very detailed um, crosswalks, special patterns, uh, there's a plaza area. We do connect, uh, as Mr. Beely indicated, we do connect our internal sidewalk from the site to that. I think, Mr. McGee, what you were, you were suggesting is that that sidewalk simply get extended to that first curb cut uh, coming into the site, which gives a little bit more uh, definition right at that intersection. And I think that um, that's a, a logical approach to uh, something like that. We do have a, a concern about um, trying to replicate that or extend that beyond. Uh, there are two lots behind this to the end of the um, potential private way. Uh, there are three lots on the other side as well. So we're talking about a grand total of um, five lots uh, that would be potentially uh, using that. If double lots are acquired, just as we had uh, discussed previously, then obviously there's no need for that. The lots at the end won't necessarily have that if, if the lots are bought across from each other. So there's a lot of flexibility, and this is you know something that as each lot comes forward, I think that um, we as applicants will be needing to demonstrate to you how the specific lot fits into the specific plan uh, for the Innovation District, but we would also respectfully request that because it is the Innovation District and there were sort of these general visionary 
parameters that were set forth that we do have the ability to implement them. With, with that said, if I have a, a comment exactly on what's being said there, that yes, we would like to think of it as innovation and visionary, but going back to something like the Pleasant Hill Industrial Park is not innovative and visionary, so I would ask that we think of it in those terms, Nancy. So I'm glad you brought that up. And, and, I, and I do agree with that. Um, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, thoughts and ideas have evolved uh, over time. But I think that, you know, one of the things with the uh, ability to have the shared bike ped lane uh, is something that's a good uh, idea for a setting like this, um, something that doesn't really rise to the occasion of formalized sidewalks and crosswalks and that type of thing because there are, there is a pedestrian network that was already designed uh, for the innovation district in the innovation, along innovation way itself. There are connection points to trailheads. There's no connection to a trailhead uh, along this private way. So those are the types of things we want to get to, we want to get the people to the right locations, um, but we also need to be respectful of the fact that not every place on the site is appropriate for a sidewalk. It won't necessarily always get used. Thank you. Um, so hopefully the curb cut situation is, is very clear to you now. <laughs> I'm not sure you get garnered enough information to do anything at this point. Um, we all offered two cents, but I'm not sure we actually gave you how we really feel about this. I personally think um, I, would like see, I would like to see one more effort at tightening that up a little. Uh, and your best effort at tightening that up, re respecting the use of the applicant. I mean, we know he's got to get stuff in and out safely. Um, there were comments uh, in the peer review memoranda about the turning movements, that type of thing. Um, is, is the tightening up process something that the board would feel comfortable that we could work that out with the staff and the peer reviewers, showing physical demonstrations of what these trucks are, what they need to be, um, having that be a condition of approval, uh, that we move forward, um, working that out at a staff level. Hi, Angela. Can I? <laughs> I guess it, it depends on how comfortable um, the board is with looking at. I, I think you made up a good point. You had a good point um, about how those and, and the applicant and how they use those fleet parking and whether that turning movement, because this is the first I'm seeing of the auto turn, is what vehicle you're using for those and if there's an opportunity to angle those, is there opportunity even to go to 90 degrees from the building and, and different maneuvering and if everybody's open to trying kind of looking at that with kind of fresh eyes a little bit. Um, so I guess it would be depending on how your comfort level of, because I mean it could change what you've seen too. And um, I don't know how much rope you want to give staff on that. You know what I mean? And I, how much yeah. they're willing to kind of. For what it's worth, I like to see <laughs> staff comfortable with what they're looking at. Um, not to say that if there's something that um, has come before this board, and I'm sure Jamel would be the first to tell you that sometimes I don't always agree with staff's interpretation of something, um, and he knows that, but I, the more comfortable staff here, is here with, one, the overall master plan, the design, and then, of course, how it fits the applicant's needs, um, I think our staff does a great job using judgment, and, and I would say it's definitely a worthwhile effort. I think it would have to come back in front of us. I, I, I don't see how you get around it because I suspect if there is a solution to it, it's going to alter maybe some of the other, other things we're seeing in this plan. I, maybe not significantly, but enough to want to give another look. So, um, if I could just jump in too, sure. um, you, I do understand that you disagree. I fully understand that, and you know, we staff is just looking at the materials that were provided during the master plan that set the tone for the project and and looking at what you guys approved and what was pitched and really trying to make sure that what was proposed during master plan is what happens on on earth so we're not just trying to be difficult we're trying to look at the standards and, and do our job so just wanted to throw that up there I like to say you do it well so, uh, we appreciate it so I, I think for for that for my two cents I'd like one more crack at trying to see if there's a, something else there 
that can either get that opening a little smaller, whether it's the angled parking, whether it's, I'm not sure, whether it's shifting the building eight feet down, I don't know. But one more crack at it. Um, and then and then come back. I mean, that's my two cents. Anyone else here want to agree or disagree? I'm completely behind you. Okay. Anyone? I, I mean, disagree. What are we talking about? I, would one foot satisfy you, or two feet, or no. I mean, it's just it's it's arbitrary, and it's um, I think they've spent probably quite a bit of time trying to figure this out because they knew from the previous meeting that just this was a concern. Um, I, I hate to be a contrarian on this, but I just it's okay to be a contrarian. Right? I and, and I, I think your point's valid. How much is enough? Um, but I think. Again, it goes back to, I think, this, which is, you know, I think we're looking at a front lot being used like a back lot, or I'm sorry, back lot being used in a front lot space. And I think that's the concern, which is, how does this look going forward everywhere else? And and, and if this was on, uh, if this second, you know, the, the uh, back access was on a regular road, I, I would understand the concern, you know, but this is a private, this is a private road. This is what this is all designed to be. Uh, and we, I think we want to try and be flexible enough to accommodate the business needs, what, what the business owner feels. I think we can be flexible, but I think we, if it's inconsistent with the master plan, like staff has said, I think we need, we, there can be a middle ground. Well, what, it, what, what is consistent then? One foot, two feet, 10 feet? That's my point. I haven't put a number on it. All right. Yeah. I think the problem is that it's unknown. And that's right. That's what I'm It's about to be hearing. defined, Roger. <laughs> is, I think what you're learning here is it's about to be defined. It's going to be a threshold that this board sets um, for acceptance within, the, within these private ways. So, Mr. Chairman, if I could just ask a clarification question. Sure. Um, the widest curb cut that we have on there is about 100 feet. Um, mm -hmm. The image that Dan presented at the beginning showed actually 187 feet uh, on the opening uh, for one of the lots that it was a double lot, so it went back the double depth uh, for that, but the building was a front building, if you will. So my question is, if this layout, just as it is, were one lot back, would there still be that concern? I don't think it I. I Correct me if I'm wrong, Jamel, but it seems like that does this design one lot back kind of conforms with I'm sorry, missed the page. The back lot that was proposed in the master plan set. Yeah, right here. Because the back lot the back lots show uh, those multiple openings, actually all opening. In this in this case scenario I don't see any any closing whatsoever. Is that curbed? Yeah, if you look at the regulating plan, that this is a front lot um, as designed, and they have different standards than back lots. So one lot back would be a diff would make a difference. Well, I do appreciate that. I'm not asking on behalf of the applicant. I'm asking on behalf of the future. Um, if if this is something that you know we're going to you know have to address in a more close fashion because of the situation of the lot, or whether this is something that needs to be addressed. Globally. And just for anyone at home, if you yeah. can zoom in, I know we don't do that. <laughs> uh, just to be clear, though, I, you, it's clearly defined here in these blue and you know the blue is these front lots, and there's a specific type and format that those follow versus the orange in the back. Right. And those were also just to clarify. Those are provided as templates, as examples of how lots can be laid out. I mean, there are. A lot of different businesses they're going to have different circulation different access needs so this is that was not intended to be a this is the front lot site plan this is the back lot site plan um, this site plan actually happens to be a bit of a hybrid the front two-thirds of the lot meets the front lot picture um, that all of a sudden is required on front lots and the back third meets the back lot standard. If you look here, that's the back line of all the other front lots. So if that's the standard we're establishing, 
this lot is two thirds a front lot and one third a back lot. Um, so those were not intended to be the only way lots are developed. They're good guidance around where buildings should go, where parking should go, where access should go. Um, but for one picture to become the standard is, I think we would, we would have to revisit the master plan in terms of um, expectations if, that, if that's now the site plan for each site. Because that's not going to work for everybody. We've tried to balance this where office is up front, the people side of the building is up front, um, the loading bays are on the back third of the building. It's a very long building. Landscaping will screen the loading bays and the business and circulations occurring on the back third. So I think it's pretty, in my opinion, it's pretty easy to argue that this is meeting the standards of the innovation district. Um, and an opening along uh, a shared driveway, I mean, I would argue is really should be judged based on is it safe? You know, is maneuvering in and out safe? Um, is circulation safe? Is it occurring in a way that's on a quiet shared drive or on a busy street? That's really around, that's, that's really the basis for, from an engineering standpoint in terms of why a curb cut opening should be big or should be small. So stormwater, stormwater is managed internal to the site. So the, the curbing isn't key for stormwater. So I think we need to um, have some flexibility here that kind of balances what you're, you're looking at. Um, and I think this site plan does, personally. Thanks, Dan. Um, it's a lot to mull over. Um, so board, um, I heard Robin say that she was more comfortable seeing them give one more crack at reworking that. Um, I would too, um, with the addition that um, a distributed copy of your auto turn exhibits would be helpful, identifying what size and type of vehicles you're showing. Um, and I, I, while I agree um, that I would like to see your team take another shot at this. I recognize that the the result of that might be very similar to what this is. So if you're showing, hey, we 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 checked it with auto turn with um, the following vehicles. We threw in a semi truck for good measure because once in a while we have to accommodate that. And this is how it works, or this is how it doesn't work. I think that would be helpful um, for this board. It would be helpful for me. And I think it would be helpful in terms of setting precedent for other properties to follow on this otherwise sort of uncharted territory. Because just at, at face value, an 80-foot wide driveway is, is a lot. And um, you know the, the connections drawn, I think, are interesting with some of the other industrial sites, those off of Pleasant Hill Road and those in um, Bayside in Portland. Interestingly, the maybe this is a coincidence, maybe it's not. Um, the, the Bayside example, um, the advisory bike ped lane has come up quietly in that context as well. And I don't know if that is sort of in mitigation to an era of industrial development in an area where curb cuts weren't even considered and sort of now we're, we're you know, we're trying to play catch up with an area that has changing uses and much more bike ped traffic than it was probably ever dreamed of versus the situation here, which is we're, we're 180 from that. We, we get to pick what, what's going here. Um, and I would just want to make sure that we are obviously doing it thoughtfully, um, but that we're not uh, creating, creating a problem. I have more to say on the bike pad thing so, when we get there. Well said. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I, I've got three, and then Rick, do you want to weigh in? And Rick, on whether or not you'd like to see this one more crack at night, I'll completely agree with Jen. We might see something very similar come back at us. It's completely possible. But to say that we didn't try to exhaust some, some of it, I think would be a mistake at this juncture. That's my two cents. Rick? Yeah, I'd like to um, just jump back in. Um, so I agree, I, I don't like to have different standards for different, I like everybody to adhere to the same standard um, whenever possible. 
But Dan, ba Mr. Bacon did have a good point that that's a hybrid lot, which I hadn't noticed before. Um, so I understand the, the point that the curb cuts, um, minimizing the curb cuts whenever possible makes sense, but I'd like to give some flexibility to, um, to the lots that cover two different lots too. So um, I'd like to see it come back one more time, just like you said. Um, but I'd be more likely to um, allow the bigger curb cut in the back, realizing that it's kind of a hybrid model. Thanks, Rick. Rick? Yeah, that was my point when I said it's the biggest lot there, and it, it needed to have a little bit of consideration for that. Uh, but. I like the suggestion of doing the simulation of the different vehicle types just for the fact that we would have it on record then and future developments or future sites, uh, we'd be able to uh, uh, have some record of uh, what we did on this site. Yeah. I think, so I think what you're hearing is we want one more try at this. Yeah. So. Um, we got a lot more stuff to cover here. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll stop that subject for now. Um, let's go into uh, the pedestrian bike uh, walkway idea um, and then sidewalks or anything else uh, having to do on that driveway, please. Roger, you wanna? I'll let somebody else go. On. Okay, <laughs> Jen. You get first crack at it. Okay. Um, first, actually, is a question for Angela because um, the Eastern Road treatment here in Scarborough is one of the first and one of not many instances where this treatment has already been used um, in the greater area. So I'm just curious, sorry, the, um, the bike ped advisory mm -hmm. lane. So I'm curious if you, um, or, or Jamel actually, if any, any staff can speak to um, the success of that? Do we have a lot of complaints about it? Do we have any, do you have any knowledge of safety concerns offhand understanding that this is all on the fly? Um, I think overall that's been a huge success and probably Dan can probably speak to it best when we first did it. We did a lot of surveys around that before mm -hmm. and after and we had a lot of very positive initial feedback too. We had some, um, some positive but also some um, helpful tweaks that we did because we had the opportunity to do that. So we tweaked it a little with some of the widths, um, which since then, I will say, um, we've, I've, I've received positive. I know the police department, um, checking with them a few times off and on, have not gotten complaints, which is usually a good thing. We don't hear good news, right? right? We only hear bad news. Um, so I would say it's a positive thing in that I'm also hearing from other municipalities that want to incorporate it in some of their roads. So we've been talking um, about it with some other communities and this isn't the fit for all roads. And so we we're talking about specifically what that road has for unique features mm -hmm. as far as volumes and, and peds and, and bikes and all that. Um, so. I think others are seeing that success as well and, and want to try it. So I think that's a big kudos to actually Dan's vision to start. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Um, I tend to agree. Um, having spent time in the bike advocacy community, the treatment on Eastern Road was um, heralded as a great success for the general, you know, southern Maine area, places where we have development, but we also have this desire <coughs> for active transportation and bike ped movements. Um, and that, that project and that treatment um, was talked about in context of being a successful way to have a couple of things occurring uh, that, that could tend to be conflicting, but figuring out a way for everyone to um, you know, do what they want to do in the same in the same space. Um, so I think the treatment here is interesting. Um, 
it's probably a good fit, in my opinion, in terms of speed. You're probably going to have very low speed traffic on this road because it does, it's not very long. Um, it's it's straight, but it you know it's you're, it's it's not going to be cut through traffic or anything like that where someone's generally rushing to get somewhere. Um, and you know you're going to have activity and the the um, the landscape treatments as shown in this rendering. Uh, in addition and response to our um, ordinances will provide you know sort of some buffering to help to help um, create define that space the only thing that that trips me up like I mentioned before was the turning movements and it, in, and in these cases it's not just turning movements but it's turning movements of probably larger vehicles um, so that just sort of is a full circle way of, of coming back to the re request that you take a look at that driveway uh, width again for a, a second or seventh time. <laughs> I know I know you spent a lot of time on it already. Um, the uh, I do think that the suggestion of double striping that lane is a good idea. So not only the dashed line that would differentiate between through traffic and um, someone walking in that space, but also the backside of that, so, you know, a five-foot uh, double line. You might also give thought to um, enhanced, <coughs> excuse me, pavement markings where typical paint, especially under the weight and turning of large vehicles, tends to wear off even more quickly than it does regularly, which is very quickly. Um, and maybe even a different, um, you know, uh, a marking or signage or some other way of communicating, hey, here's what's going on here. Um, and I know that um, there were comments earlier about extending a sidewalk up onto this uh, private way. I guess it doesn't have a name necessarily. Um, but I do think that that is what this treatment is intended to do, is to communicate a space for people to be walking or biking. Um, and I think that the argument that, that taking care of the space in terms of maintenance, both paving and snow clearing, for example, you are going to have better luck with that at the edge of this driveway than you would say with a dedicated separated sidewalk that requires different equipment to plow. Um, and repave at, at some point down the road. Um, comment that I would have would be to maybe consider, and I don't know if there's precedent for this elsewhere, but actually the rendering, um, the landscape rendering that you have, oh, right down here, um, shows a good, a good example. Um, if the corner of this intersection is in fact intended to be treated with this pavers, this looks like sort of a unique, you know, it's not brick, um, granite paver stone kind of treatment. Uh, point being no hardscape, nothing vertical to prevent someone from cutting that corner really tightly, which would in fact mean that they're traveling in pedestrian space. Um, you might consider extending the dash line out around this corner, which I understand people can still drive over the paint, but it might be an, just a small visual cue to help guide uh, traffic, and particularly trucks whose trailers might be taking a larger swing to kind of stay out in their um, their travel lane rounding that corner. Um, yes. Can I clarify something too that when you were talking about the the intersection and how that's a little different, I just wanted to point out. In our instance on um, Eastern Road and Black Point Road, we actually do have a sidewalk that comes in and then it transitions to that. Okay. Because that was the concern that Nick, like Nick had brought up before, was how you transition through that intersection yep. with those turning movements, and that's exactly what we have at Black Point just Road. Just a little. We have a, um, just that first length, you know, so cars queued there, you're actually yep. on a sidewalk before you get into, um, and, and I don't know if what, if you guys were looking at them in, in other, towns if there's an instance that that's different I'm just wanted to point out know. that's what we have here <laughs> that has been successful um, so. sure that's helpful context also you know the, I can see that being relevant differently relevant for bikes than pedestrians that's all and again 
understanding full well context here being probably low volume for these um, these modes, but you never know. I don't know. One brewery at the end of this road, and I feel like you're going to have a lot of foot traffic. That's just like my, my take on it. Um, and what else? Um, oh, sidewalk. Uh, not necessarily tied to long lengths of sidewalk being extended up the private way, but I do think there may be some merit in extending the proposed sidewalk actually further along um, innovation way to at least cover the frontage of those remaining um, head and parking spaces. Right there. So further to the right, if you had people exiting. To the those. east. To the east, yes, sorry. Hmm. That's all. Thank you, Jeff. You warmed up, Roger? I, actually, I agree with Jen. <laughs> <laughs> she took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> Rick Mankin. I'll leave it to the expert on the, the pedestrian traffic flow, but I do like the idea of that sidewalk being <clears throat> uh, taken toward uh, down the, the private way uh, just a bit more. Thanks, Rick. Rick? Robin? Great. Okay. That was easy, right? <laughs> uh, next element, I think that we really probably should give them some uh, guidance on would be parking. Um, it's one of the main elements. I'll, I'll kick this one off. I'm comfortable with seeing 15 spots. I, um, I believe town is, uh, the town probably would want to see some sort of note if the um, ownership or user changes in here, then uh, they would have to come back for a kind of a site plan amendment to reevaluate the parking areas. I think it was indicated to me that staff would be comfortable with an approach like that. I think that's reasonable. Um, Anyone else want to chime in on that? Uh, didn't we, um, wasn't there a, con a condition in, in the last on, on score builders for the additional three lots? Yeah, the, and it had something to do with, you know, they would have to, if there was a change, repurpose building or something like that, they'd have to come so back. Similar. So um, same thing. The difference is, is 37 spots would have to go in. Well, it even be more <laughs> right, so. Versus three. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the same principle, though. Right. Yeah, same, yeah, same principle. So I think, um, I think as far as parking goes, I didn't see anyone object strenuously to that. So I think as parking goes, you're all set on that one. Um, and then after that, I think uh, fenestration, I think we should have a quick weigh in uh, whether or not the building is pretty enough. Uh, board, um, got a thumbs up there. Everyone. I like the, off the owner's office. He's got a nice little canopy on that corner there, looking good. <laughs> okay. And then. Um, uh, does anyone want to get into plantings and, and buffering? I, I would say that I, I did pick up on what Roger brought up, which is if the seagrass in the front gets too tall, you will block your sign. So maybe a reconsideration of what gets planted there. Um, so the, the plantings in the front, they're ornamental grass, but they're a different type. So they're a lower a fescue mixed with a, uh, a perennial. Um, in behind the sign is a taller grass. Okay. So, Thanks for clarifying yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and then I will open this up to the board for any other general comments on this plan. Rick Meinking, yes. Just have one, and it's on the photometrics. The front lighting um, looks like it's bleeding over into Innovation Drive, and I think maybe we can get better cutoffs on the fixtures so that the light, particularly it looks like from the S3 light, bleeds over into Innovation Way. Maybe we can get that cut off, keep the light on the parking lot, but not on the, on the street. That's all I have. Thank you. Anyone else with a comment? Yeah. I just have a quick, Rick? are the trees that are shown, are the trees that are depicted there, are those plans to be there? Yeah, those are based yeah. on the, okay. the planting plans, combination of the Innovation Way plan and the site plan. Okay. Yeah. Just in, in lieu of trees, if we could be. Yeah, I understand. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't eliminating all the trees because I mean I understand you want 
sorry. In lieu of trees. I understand trees. that you want your building to be seen, and it is a very nice building. I compliment the architect, but yeah. um, again, trying to keep everybody to the same standards, we do require buffering. We have to have some, but I think that's sufficient from what I can tell. Kevin. Along that same line, just ask for some creativity for the trees that you are going to be not using, if we could have some creativity there, and I know it'll come from the back row there. Thank you, Robin. Roger. Um, yeah, the um, the buffering on the um, east side, you know, the the building that's really correct. Yeah. Um, I I tend to agree with Nancy on this. It's going to be like ornamental grasses. Uh, it's a it's a pollinator meadow, so it's okay. perennials, it's like just wildflowers, wild <laughs> colorful changes, that type of thing. Uh, um, I, I'm okay with that because it's quite possible the buildings that are going to be adjacent to it might be right smack up against it also. So I'm on the same I page just, with Roger just, on that one. I don't think the east side needs a whole lot for plantings. I just wanted to make sure that there was a clarification on that. That's all. Okay. So I know not necessarily the desired result this evening. However, you are well on your way. So take solace in that. We do appreciate it. We will be back. We're on a construction timeline with winter weather and so that is the, the concern and the motivating force so uh, we will certainly be back right uh, before you again and work with staff in the interim uh, to come up with a plan and I do appreciate the acknowledgement that it may not be different in significant ways from what you've seen and uh, we are we are sensitive and excited also to have the applicant be part of this community again um, so yeah it might be the same. Hopefully, it's a quick one. Thank you've, you. You've worked through the most of the hard stuff, I think, this evening. So, <laughs> <That's> good. <laughs> good luck. Thank you. Next item uh, tonight is Devel Developers Collaborative Pre-Development LLC requests a sketch plan review for the Downs Phase One Mixed Residential Development Assessor's Map R52 Lot Four. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we're actually moving on to the southern portion of the Downs uh, project um, along Scarborough Downs Road uh, within phase one along the left side of the road as you enter uh, from route one. Um, so the applicant's in for a sketch plan. This generally provides the applicant and the board an opportunity to have a high level of discussion about the projects as they, to help inform them as they prepare for a formal site plan application. Uh, so just quickly, the applicant's proposing a multi-phase project that includes uh, two four-story buildings um, consisting of 77 one-bedroom se senior housing units. Uh, staff would like to point out the project is located within a portion of remaining land uh, within phase one of the downs, and it appears that a subdivision amendment uh, may be necessary. Um, if, so if that's required, the amendment um, can take place you know, concurrently with the site plan review process. Staff also suggests that the applicant discuss uh, the intent of the proposed lot division um, as it appeared that there was some grading sort of bleeding over off of the proposed lot on the site. And staff finally uh, recommended that the applicant remove, actually remove the mid-block crosswalk um, across Scarborough Downs Road and instead provide a sidewalk along their frontage. Um, this will help to minimize unnecessary mid-block crosswalks. Um, provide an important section of sidewalk that could eventually be extended to Route 1 um, when you could cross the road there once that intersection is reconstructed in the future. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jamal. Please just state your name for the record and introduce your project. Good evening. My name is Laura Reading. I'm a project manager at Developers Collaborative, uh, and I'm here with our engineer, Stephen Bushy from Goral Palmer. Um, We've, uh, you know, reviewed the, the staff comments and happy to, to answer any questions and go through those discussion items. All right. There is opportunity for public comment this evening. If there's anyone here that would like to speak on this. Seeing none, I'll close public comment. Robin. Hi. Hi. Your turn. Um, did you receive, you did receive the staff, um, suggestions? Yes. Are you, do you have heartache with any of them? Um, I would just like to, to confirm your, um, uh, 
comment on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. um, so are you proposing uh, that we have the sidewalk just along the um, our frontage on the road? Uh, is there? Do you, do you want me to jump in, Mr. Chair? Please. Go ahead. That's his. I'll probably own that one. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I think staff's looking at it more of a holistic for the whole phase one, which is basically what's built there now, back to Route One, and the understanding is that. Um, the intersection at Route 1 will get rebuilt at some point in the future, and I, I would say near future by the rate they're going. And so um, real, really looking at where they cross is all wooded, and there's no potential really for development on that side, so it's really crossing to nothing. Um, the sidewalk obviously is crucial heading up to the um, bus shelter. Um, and then also connects, is a crossing there to Mill Commons, which connects to the whole neighborhood. So the opportunity was looking at is, like she had said, is really looking at the whole frontage. Um, and so connecting the sidewalk back to Route 1, as long as, in this case, getting along your frontage, and then the opportunity for when they redo the intersection, continue that sidewalk um, to a signalized pedestrian safe crossing. Um, because there's really no other reason to be crossing from really that bus shelter all the way back to Route 1. There's, there's really nothing on that side. Um, and so that would give us an opportunity to kind of look at the big picture and how the pedestrian network would work when they're all said and done. If that makes sense. Um, does that? Yeah, until, so until that connecting portion of the sidewalk yep. from our a lot to Route 1. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we would still need a crosswalk uh, to be able to access so that our residents could cross the street and access Route 1 on the sidewalk. Do you think your residents, I'm sorry, I'm going to not give any. <laughs> well, you're doing a great job. <laughs> Maybe I should let the board speak on this, but I, I guess my opinion is looking at, I, I don't see that. Um, being that far out. Once you punch through Hagas, we're talking about the overall TMP for the project. Really, Route 1 is going to have to be addressed. Um, and so then we'd end up with a crosswalk we can't get rid of. That really is not where it should be. Um, and we do have a crosswalk just at the line, the match line of this page is where the bus shop, uh, bus, bus shelter is. Um, and that's where the crossing is. Um, for the neighborhood too. So um, I know I don't like to walk on Route 1. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think I'd want a signalized crosswalk myself. And um, that's just, I will let the board kind of weigh in on that though. Can, can I make a quick comment? Sure. Uh, one of our funding requirements is making sure that our residents do have access to those businesses on Route 1 on a accessible, safe walking path. Um, so we do, you know, in, in the interim of, you know, depending on what the timeline is on that connecting sidewalk, we we do need a way to, to get them there. And, um, you know, going north to that crosswalk and then back down would change that half mile distance that um, businesses are supposed to be located within the project. Can I keep going? You can. I'm doing such a good job. <laughs> <laughs> that one um, I, I first want to comment and say that I really appreciate you just opening it up for discussion, especially at this hour. It's very much appreciated. Um, and um, I, I would, I feel comfortable that you and staff would probably be able to come up with some type of. Um, compromise that would still allow you funding not necessarily have such a great distance for your patrons to to walk and things like that but um, were there any other things that gave you heartburn I'm wondering about the electric vehicle charging stations things like that 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 was uh, you know certainly I'm not, you know I'm not uh, I'm, I'm new to uh, those we've never installed one on, in our projects okay um, uh, and so the, you know, any additional operating costs that that would add to mm -hmm. us, um, mm -hmm. 
would certainly be difficult. The, the operating budgets on these projects can be pretty mm -hmm. tight. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's certainly a concern. And I will say that was the one that sort of popped out at me as considering your use. And I'm not, I'm not I don't know, I don't know. I, I won't, I won't, I think I'm stereotyping as to who gets smart cars, but. Um, They're not inexpensive. Just vehicles. saying. Yeah, we all have our downfalls. Um, mine is stereotyping. Um, any other, any other sort of issues with the staff comments or where you'd want issues? Otherwise, I'm, I'm feeling like the staff comments are right on the money. I think this project is, 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 um, on the money also you're moving in a very um good direction as far as um the use and um of the of the property and and what you what you're intending great um, yeah do you have anything else that you want to steve bushy with uh, goral palmer and uh as mm -hmm. robin's asking the questions right now i would point out uh our stormwater management um approach i'm talking very hard with the owner to use a porous pavement throughout oh. the parking lot area. Uh, a little new. I've mm -hmm. done some projects now with porous pavement mm -hmm. and I like it. Uh, we're somewhat unique in this little corner of the downs, mm -hmm. uh, whereas much of the rest of the downs has relied upon grass underdrain filters, some wet ponds I think are being used over in the innovation district and so forth. We're kind of in our own little zone here because yeah. our water goes mostly towards route one mm -hmm. so i think the given the use here with the residential uh the porous pavement will work out good my best example for porous pavement uh, has been the dhs site over off the jetport boulevard so we did that site a number of years ago and it's worked out pretty good have some maintenance responsibilities with having porous pavement but uh, on the flip side of that which i is my selling point is that uh, you don't use as much salt or excuse me sand um, and then you're not dragging sand through your building ruining carpets and ruining floors so you know there's a plus to that so how that's did you know i was like i was trying to keep the storm, the ms4 conversation out of the last project <laughs> i was like not there robin not there but thank you steve i really appreciate that and um, I think uh, that you do have a, some really good opportunity here for low impact development. Have you thought anything else about like drip line trenches or anything like that for things? Good, excellent. I'm, I'm, I don't really have anything else, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Rick Perry. Um, I think the sidewalk issue is pretty important. So you ha have to look at that. Um, because everything Angela said made sense. And I just, I looked at the staff comments and I, I know as a board, we're most likely gonna feel pretty strongly about this idol. Um, and as far as the crosswalk goes, uh, we weren't aware of course of the funding issue until tonight, but um, I don't think there's such a thing as a temporary sidewalk, but uh, I mean a temporary crosswalk, but because once you establish a crosswalk, people kind of think that it's always there. Um, so that's going to be kind of a challenge for you. Um, everything else looks fine to me. Thank you, Rick. Rick Meinking. Let me say something about the EV chargers. Um, yeah, I like the staff comment that they should be included. Please take a look at maybe a couple level ones. You don't have to go to the big expense of doing level twos or threes. Uh, the cars that are going to sit there are going to sit there for a while and can take charge. Um, and I heard there was rebates for new EVs, and so some of your tenants may be of that uh, sort of do-gooder and are going to purchase EVs. So don't take that off the table. Just one question, why is one building 39 units and one 38 with the same square footage? What's the difference going on in one of the buildings? It's more of a curiosity than anything. Yeah. Um, there, there were um, some iterations of you know the same essentially the same building um 
and I think it I think it came down uh, there was a density discussion um, for the most part and one's, one's a little bit one's gonna be yours huh? <laughs> um, then finally just let me encourage you to take a look at alternative heating and cooling kind of systems for these types of building multifamily or or these kind of apartments um, take a look at the variable flow refrigerant um, with a heat recovery so you can get as you build up on the stories you may find that and you can go downtown and see all of them with the three stories and there's windows open in the winter time on the top floor and on the bottom floor um, the tenants aren't getting enough heat uh, with the VRFs you can with the heat recovery you can actually be heating upstairs and cooling or uh, cooling upstairs and heating downstairs in the winter time um, really efficient and when you talk about an operating budget that may have some constraints uh, these would be an answer for that and then to wrap that all up when you if you do choose that um, there's ways you can make those big units that are outside kind of blend in and you can buffer those enough so that they don't become these huge boxes that sit out on on the sides of the buildings so just take that for some consideration and uh, I think that would really set a nice uh, atmosphere there that's all mr. chair thanks Rick. Jen um, I actually had a question that Angela answered, which was, what is the distance to the next closest crosswalk, and was there one present at the, um, the bus shelters that are shown just at the edge of your page? It might be helpful in the future to either show that or provide a distance or a note or something that says um, that, that distance. I do think that the proximity of that to this facility um, is great for your potential um, tenants, but also do share the concern for a mid-block crossing here, especially with the context that there would be another one um, right up there at that bus stop. Um, but, you know, I think it's great to encourage anyone and then likely your demographic here, you know, making sure that they have safe infrastructure um, on which to get around however they choose. Um, a question about the terrace areas that you show at the side of each building. It looks like those are proposed to be fenced in. Is that correct? Um, that does look like fencing, yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious if that's a requirement or a strong preference by the development team. And the reason that I'm asking is because if for some reason that was not a requirement, you could potentially shorten someone's walking distance by quite a bit if you were to have um, a sidewalk or path or trail or something from the corner of each of those buildings uh, headed um, to the right of this page towards the bus shelter and to the left of the page towards Route 1. Um, and my guess is it would be a nicer walk anyway than walking out along uh, the roadway. Um, but again, not knowing your full development program, you, maybe that does need to be a secured area. Um, but you, you know, the option it does look like there's a little bit of room there to work with, and maybe the shape of it could be changed a little bit um, to make some of those connections. Just for clarification, you're talking something from these zone, this zone here. Mm -hmm. This is the phase two building, by the way, and this is the phase one building. And then from this zone here, if we're going to have a sidewalk that would extend certainly for this project along this piece and hopefully then it extends over to route one mm -hmm. just getting some nice connectivity more than just these couple of spots there right yeah yes. okay great yeah um and then wondering if someone could speak a little bit to the number of um accessible parking spaces proposed here i know that um for general site planning that's a lot also understanding that your usage here is different than you know standard office or even residential um, and so whether or not you arrived at this number based on or just how how you arrived at that number yeah so this is the the maximum number of ADA spaces that 
um, we might need to provide. We, uh, at a minimum, we're required to provide um, four accessible units uh, for each building, and we're pledging an additional 10 units. Uh, and so we need to have the ability to, um, for those pledged additional pledged units, um, we need to have the ability to provide accessible parking for them if needed. Um, but if, if um, those tenants do not need them, then they wouldn't be um, striped as such. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. Roger. This is working out really well. She's, she's asking all my questions. <laughs> <coughs> Um, do you um, do you have a problem with the uh, additional buffering along the um, what is it here? You know, on the back of the property and then, then down on the as, as stated in the uh, comments, right along the yard and then on the other side. No problem with that. Um, just reviewing that comments. Um, I was going to ask ask you about the um, the terraces also, but that got clarified with Jen. This um, when you go into, I'm just kind of curious. When you go into the main entrance, what's that little tan rectangle right there? What's that uh, going to be for a transformer pad? Oh, okay. And down on the f way on the far right, this what's what's that little one it's there? The same. Same for thing. The second okay. building. Yeah. Um, I think I think it's. Uh, oh, I do have a question for staff uh, on the uh, elect um, the um, electric vehicle charging stations. Um, where 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 is it? Uh, when when do we say we want you to do something or just consider it? I mean, as an example, I know one of the other projects, Eastern Village, the developer initially was going to put them in there, and I think he's decided not to at this point. Um, it seems to me that that would be a demand that may come from whoever's living there. You know, if, if somebody buys an electric vehicle and, they, and they're going to reside there, they might come to the landlord and say, geez, can you put in some ch you know, charging stations? So I'm kind of curious where, where, the, where we, we stand on that. Yeah, so there's actually not a standard in the site plan ordinance asking for those. Um, I think it's something that the town is interested in working on, um, given the popularity of EVs, um, and this board seems to be interested in EVs. Um, so we threw that in there as a discussion point for sketch plan. Um, there is some provisions for alternative transportation and such in the site plan ordinance, so I think you'd see that forthcoming, um, but it was just worth a, you know, a discussion point to get it on the table uh, ahead of time. The, the other thing, um, I don't know if you, if you thought about this, but this has come up with uh, other apartment complexes where they have a separate building for receiving, you know, um, items that they purchased. Um, you, are you thinking about that? Uh, yeah, I think we. The idea is that in our lobby in the main entry, we typically provide yeah. uh, sufficient room for packages um, for the okay. tenants. Um, so basically, the electronic uh, electric vehicle thing is just something to. If they haven't thought about it, think about it right now. Okay. Exactly. All right. Okay. Um, I, I think this is. Um, oh, is this going to be subsidized? Or is it just just going to be market? Low income housing tax credit. Pardon me. Yes, uh, low income housing tax credit project. Oh, okay. So maybe I can't live here. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I, I think I'm all set. Thanks, Roger. So um, for. My two cents, uh, the configuration in, in of the buildings where the parking, you know, the bulk of your parking goes into phase one and then phase two, you've got, you know, a smaller set of parking. I feel like the distance that a, a resident would walk from their building to maybe an available parking space is probably quite extensive. I'm wondering whether or not the actual layout, I'll let you guys engineer this, but wouldn't it be better to put the two buildings closer to the main drive with an extended parking field closer to the second phase building because I feel like if you lived in this unit you are gonna end up parking next to that dumpster and then my other question was just from a logistical standpoint is are the residents here responsible for getting their trash out to that dumpster in the way back corner 
or is there a trash room in the building that somebody empties and brings out to that dumpster? Just logistically speaking, I'm, I'm sure there are very, very capable senior people living there. However, not all of them will be. So I, I think just ease of use wise, yeah. maybe a second look at some of those things. Yeah. Um, and then I did notice the um, ADA uh, parking. I understand. I suppose I understand why it's, it seems like you'll have good reasonings for it. I, um, just on a quick tidying up, no, no big deal. Um, on the plan here, it says including 30 ADA, and then in your narrative, it said up to 29 ADA. Just on, might want to just make those simpatico. And then um, I do agree with kind of Angela's insights as to the, you know, the crossing sidewalk area. Um, the fencing area around those resident terraces, um, I like Jen's idea of maybe connecting those out if it's possible in a safe manner. Um, but also, um, you know, also provides you with some opportunity for some good buffering in those areas as well. So um, landscape buffering. I think that's it. Everyone else covered the bulk of it. Um, anything we've said that has scared you and you need clarity on? <laughs> Not necessarily. I, I am wondering if there would be less issue if the crosswalk was located here. That was a thought I had too. If you, I, I mean, I, I, the only reason that popped into my head when I was looking at the plan, I'm not saying yes or no, by the way, I'm just saying it, it did pop into my head that maybe the better spot was way back there, just based on um, where the bulk of the people, their cars, their access to their houses might be, it might actually work out more people are over there. But <coughs> that was just a thought I had too. But Angela, do you have a thought on that? Of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would just say that um, I think regardless, I don't think it much matters the, the intent of where that crosswalk is. I think I just wanted to point out that from their lot line is I believe 400 feet to Route 1 so it might be something you look at just extending the sidewalk to Route 1 and having that safe crossing, actually. Because turning off and having such a short distance with a crosswalk again, because eventually, again, I'm looking at this as the big picture of the downs, and I think that's what we got to keep in mind is the master planning of how this sidewalk network works overall, is you're going to have a crossing at Route 1, you're going to have a crossing 400 feet, and then another 300 feet, and then it, it just, it doesn't, for no real reason once it's all completed, um, because like I said, there's not a use across the street. And so I get to the point, which like I said, I did not, was not aware of about funding, and I, I think there's a way to figure that out, and maybe that means you build another 400 feet of sidewalk or something like that. Um, I don't know. That's something they can come back and forth with. We can kind of come up with something to try to get to where they need to be. Um, but I think looking at things short-sighted is, is not a good overall way to look at the, the, the downs. Nick, <coughs> question for Angela, maybe. Sure. Um, is, the, um, is the bus shelter, I mean, is that a definite location for that? The pad is in place. It's actually oh, it installed. Is. The pad is installed right now. And yes. what is, what's across the street? Is that where the memory care unit is? Yes. Yep. Well, those people are unlikely to be using the bus, you know. Um, it's too bad the bus shelter was not closer to this facility. I think that's why it's located where it is, is so it accommodates the whole neighborhood, because you got to think about how our grist mill is up further, where there's a lot of single family houses, and then there's the density of all the apartment buildings. And so actually, when we had the conversation with staff, my first thought was, don't you want it near where everybody is? And then this project was mentioned in saying, this is why we want to be in the location they are, so they can accommodate both. Because it's pretty far walk, I would say, from, like, say, Gris, Gris Mill residents. But they have a, such a dense population here, and the use might be more of a need it, here. It maybe. would be helpful to see that, I think, contextually. So proximity right, where everything is this, in relationship to each to other. The yep. other I agree. knowns that are on the downs, and then, mm -hmm. you know, Apparently, by doing that, we would see where the, the potential um, Because I, are. I think of all the people living in this general area, mm -hmm. these are the people who would be most likely to use the bus, in my estimation. Right. I mean, there are quite a few apartment buildings, though, within the downs that have limited parking and things like that. And that was what 
Um, well, Dan's gone now, but that was what was sold kind of to the planning board is looking at all of these alternative transportation modes. Um, and so I think there's a need on both sides. Um, and so I think that's actually, I, um, once we look at, again, zoom out, it, it kind of makes sense um, where it is the close proximity to this and, and it has a longer walk for some, say, some other parts of it. Um, so I'm just keep, just wanted to keep that, the board keep that in mind. It's really, you have to, I think, to Jen's point, it's kind of helpful to see it maybe where it is in context to everything else. <clears throat> because I think that adds a lot of light to this and the discussion of how the overall sidewalk network and bikes lanes for that matter, how it all works together. And, and making sure that any crosswalks <clears throat> that do or don't go in associated with this project are done so thoughtfully because mm -hmm. as you've heard, they're, we're, it's unlikely that it would come out in the future. So even like a <clears throat> temporary crosswalk, um, would just need careful thought. <laughs> just Roger, just, just one um, last question: Is this site um, kind of low? Is that why, why is the potential drainage situation? Uh, not generally any lower than much of the rest of the towns, <laughs> which okay. is okay. kind of a flat <laughs> site. So uh, there lends the problem, I suppose, uh, but. By and large, we had some drainage. It is low down in this corner, and then it's kind of low in this area. So our site, for probably two thirds, uh, three quarters of it, it's kind of draining south towards Route One. It, it, one of the unique spots. I mean, the rest of the downs, they've carefully laid out all of their uh, uh, means for stormwater management and so forth. But that's in the bigger part of the site, and we're just a little triangular sure. corner here. No, if, if, it was, if it was low, I was going to suggest a, a name change to the lowlands at the down. <laughs> that's all. all right. <laughs> If I might, uh, Mr. Chairman, as well, just because I think it was a, a point made maybe during the staff comments or otherwise about um, this strip of land here. So there is a 15-foot wide strip that is being retained by uh, the Downs ownership, and uh, they have their basis behind all of that, but they do have an agreement to allow this developer basically to go in there and do some grading to achieve our site so there will be some grading activity and then what you'll see in our landscape plan will be pretty robust landscaping effort uh, along there for the buffering side of things so uh, we're fully aware of the need for all of that to make sure that we're covered thanks Steve all right uh, not seeing any other comments here out of the board so um, we'll look forward to seeing you again at the next round thank you very much for your thank feedback you. Next item this evening is the staff report. Oh. I guess I'll kick it off. Um, so just a reminder that there is a workshop with the Downs team uh, next week, uh, next Thursday at 6 p.m. at the Wentworth School to start the review for the Town Center Residential Neighborhood, uh, which is located just north of the Phase 1 project. And then since the last planning board meeting, we've had three pre-construction meetings, uh, one for the Bessie Commons uh, Senior Housing Project, uh, the Rock Church expansion, and the Cabinets to Go um, storage, acc accessory storage building uh, down on Route 1. And then the Route 1 Complete Street Study is nearing completion, uh, hopefully by the end of the year. And we have a Mylar um, for the Wittenwood subdivision that needs to be signed by you guys tonight. I don't know if Angela has anything. Um, I can't remember if I talked about this or not, so forgive me if I have. Um, Gorham Road has been obviously ongoing construction, and we have wrapped up the phase one piece. Just to give everyone notice that um, our phase two drainage work will hopefully be starting in November, which means could mean some traffic delays um, mm. along that stretch between Maple and Ridgewood. Ridgeway, Ridgeway. <laughs> um, hopefully only a two week window and then get in and out. So it, it um, gives us hope for kind of moving that project forward in the future. And so that's just drainage work to try to get that ahead of the gas company who will be going along um, their path down through there too. So 
really, again, big picture is really trying to connect all those neighborhoods back to the schools systems. And so at this point, obviously, we've got to Maple, but really it's that whole other section and um, a residential that um, that's a difficult path um, to traverse, I would say, that Gorham Road corridor through, that's probably the trickiest spot. So I think that um, we just want to keep moving that forward as we can. So everyone needs to be, I guess, patient while we keep kind of moving those pieces forward. I know it's been difficult in a long summer out there um, with that construction <laughs> traffic. So I appreciate everyone's patience with that. Thank you, Angela. Uh, administrative amendment report. Uh, none at this time. Correspondence. No correspondence. Planning board comments. Okay. I will make a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor. Thank you, guys. Good evening.